Good morning and welcome to City Hall. We're going to get started with the invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance. Donald Wolf is with St. Eugene Catholic Church. He's going to lead us in the invocation. Afterwards, I'll ask Councilman Griner if he'll lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. But would everyone please stand at this time? Let us pray. God of all peoples, we give you thanks for all you have entrusted us. Make us good stewards of your creation that we may name the truth of our world and shape those truths according to your will. May your blessing be upon this gathering and upon these deliberations. Help every member to work toward the common good of all and the best for our common governance. Help us all to be more attentive to the needs of the most vulnerable, the needs of the invisible, the needs of the forgotten. And we ask this in the name of Jesus, a man dear to you in life and in death. Amen. Please join me in the flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Each month, we at the City of Oklahoma City honor one of our teachers in the metro area as the Teacher of the Month. And we, we know as uh, we work with a lot of different school districts, and uh, one of them on the far north part of the city limits is the Edmond Public School System. And Kevin McDonald is here. Come on forward, Kevin. We have a resolution for you. Kevin teaches English at Memorial High School, and we have a uh, resolution. I'll ask the clerk to read it as we get settled up here. Whereas Kevin McDowell has been named Teacher of the Month for February 2016 by Edmond Public Schools Foundation and the Rotary Club of Oklahoma City. Whereas Kevin was voted by his peers as the 2014-15 Edmond Memorial Teacher of the Year and was then selected as the Edmond Public Schools Teacher of the Year for 15-16. Whereas Kevin is in his 18th year of teaching, he has taught pre-AP English II and AP English language for 17 of those years. Kevin completed his undergraduate degree at Oklahoma State University and his master's in literature at the University of Central Oklahoma. Whereas Kevin has been an active consultant for the College Board since 2004, presenting one and two day workshops, advanced placement summer institutes, and workshops at the Advanced Placement Annual Conference. Whereas Kevin has also authored the Teacher's Manual for Writing America, a textbook published by Pearson, and he currently serves as the high school co-chair for College Board's Curriculum Design and Assessment Committee for their Advanced Placement English Language and Composition course. Whereas initially he was employed at Guthrie High School, Kevin has taught at Edmund Memorial High School since the fall of 2004. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Mayor and Council of the City of Oklahoma City that they do hereby recognize and commend Kevin McDonald on his selection as February 2016 Teacher of the Month by Edmund Public Schools Foundation and the Rotary Club of Oklahoma City. Let's show our appreciation and acknowledgement for Kevin. Congratulations. The, uh, the suspense continues, however, because we actually need to vote on this. So okay. we'll have a, a motion. <laughs> And a second. All right, cast your votes. And it's unanimous. Thanks. Kevin, congratulations. I, I uh, not too long ago, ran into some of my uh, uh, writings that I did in high school, and it was not very impressive. <laughs> so, you know, you always think, I was a good writer. And then you read it, and you go, no, really, I wasn't. And, and uh, so I'm, I'm grateful to the teachers that I had at that level and, and know that you're you know, trying to help guide the, the, the writers and, and English students of tomorrow. So sure. thank you for your work. And, um, uh, hardly a, a, a week goes by where I don't run into somebody who's doing impressive things and they tell me they attended Edmund Memorial. So I know a lot of impressive students have come out of that school, so yeah. please pass along our appreciation to your thank colleagues. You. And I'll let you thank people as well. Well, obviously thank you and to the City Council as well. Um, really 
to the larger metro area. Uh, obviously, we've all benefited greatly from the various MAPS programs. I've had the good fortune to work in different high schools with different groups of students and do professional development for teachers. And so to see the efforts of the metro area and the attempt to serve Oklahoma students keeps me here. Uh, I'm a native from Texas, but I've lived in Oklahoma longer than I lived in Texas and have no intention of going home. Wait, it's not home. This is home. So, uh, and, and, it, and it's because of, of the hard work and the, on the efforts of everybody else. I want my children to be products of this state. So thank you for the recognition. Thank you. And thanks to the Edmund School Foundation and the Rotary Club of Oklahoma City for allowing us to, to thank Kevin. And, and uh, please pass along our compliments to your students and the rest of the faculty out there. All right, let's show our appreciation one more time. All right, we're on item 3B and C of the council agenda. These are appointments. I'll look for a motion. All right, comments or questions here? All right, cast your votes. Passage unanimously. Item 4 is the Journal of Council Proceedings. 4A is to receive the journal for February 9th, and 4B is to approve the journal for January 26th and February 2nd. Is there any comments or questions about the journal? All right, cast your votes. Passage unanimously. Item 5 is request for uncontested continuances. None this morning. All right. Any from council? We'll move on then. Um, let's see. Item 6 is revocable permits, and we have none there either. And so then we'll recess the council meeting, convene as the Oklahoma City Municipal Facilities Authority. Looks like there's four items on the MFA. All right, any comments or questions on the MFA? All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. We'll adjourn the OCMFA, convene as the Oklahoma City Public Property Authority. Three items here. All right, we have a motion and a second on the PPA. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. We'll adjourn the OCPPA, convene as the Oklahoma City Environmental Assistance Trust. Two items. We have a motion and a second. All right. Comments are on the EAT. All right. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. We'll adjourn the OCEAT and reconvene the council meeting with the consent docket. All right. Are there any individual considerations from the council? Okay. And Mayor uh, Doug Cupper has a short presentation on, on uh, item W, and we want to recognize some of our friends with the Community Foundation that are with us this morning. All right. Well, why don't we start with Doug's uh, presentation? Good, Mayor. Good morning, Mayor and City Council. Doug Cupper, Director of Parks and Recreation. I just, I just wanted to uh, bring you, to your attention that, that uh, once again, the Community Foundation is, is stepping forward to help our, uh, our city and, and particularly the Parks and Recreation Department take the next leap forward as it relates to uh, uh, quality of life elements, uh, both from a neighborhood perspective and a, and a Parks and Recreation perspective. Uh, as you know, we don't have Great Lakes, we don't have mountains. Uh, uh, what we do have is our urban canopy. And really, in the Midwest, in this part of the country, uh, the more trees we have, the better quality of life we have, the better way of life. People have a better outlook on our community because it gives it a sense of beauty and, and things along those lines. One of the things that the Parks and Recreation Department has been struggling with is the decline of the urban canopy in the parks. And uh, one place to start with that is to do a, a an accurate inventory of the tree canopy that we do have. Uh, 
what type of trees we have, what condition the trees are in, the age of those trees, and then uh, again formulating a plan to uh, do some succession planting, if you will, in our, our urban canopy. And the uh, Community Foundation and the uh, Kirkpatrick Family uh, Trust, as well as the uh, um, um, Boyd's Trust, have stepped forward with, uh, with a, a grant of $92,000 to hire, not a grant, but a gift. They're going to hire Davy Tree Resources to actually do a complete inventory of our parks trees. Parks trees also will include some of our larger uh, boulevards, uh, like the uh, remnants of the uh, Great Boulevard that runs around the whole city. Um, so we're, we're, we're happy. And, and the State Forester also saw the quality of what we were trying to accomplish. And even with the declining budget at the state level, uh, they stepped forward with a, a, another portion of this gift uh, to the amount of 25800 So we will get an inventory well over $100,000 in value. Uh, and again, it's that first step towards a next great step for the city of Oklahoma City. And I'd like to recognize the folks that are from the Community Foundation that are here. Obviously, Nancy Anthony, uh, the chairman of the trust. If, if you all that represent the Community Foundation stand. Our Forrester is here as well. So again, I, I'd be happy to answer any questions, but I think it, this is a great opportunity, and it's, it's a heck of a gift, in my opinion, uh, that the city is going to get from the community foundation. Yeah, so is this all trees on, public, on Oklahoma City public lands? Is that it's all trees on, on city park lands. And uh, as we get through it, uh, it's up to 20,000 trees they will survey. Uh, obviously, the large scale areas like at Trosper where we have, and Lincoln where we have those large forest areas, they won't go in and individually calibrate those, but the other portions of Lincoln Park, the other portions of Trosper, uh, uh, Stars and Stripes, uh, Edgemere, and the rest of them will get surveyed. I know the golf courses have already had something similar. Is this supersede what the golf courses were doing, or are they part of this? Or? They, they, as uh, the tree numbers allow, we will include the golf courses because we feel those are important aspects of our canopy as well. But uh, since they have done their work and they continue to monitor their trees, we think it's more important to get into the hardcore sections of parks, Will Rogers and places like that. All right. And another example of uh, leaving money to the Community Foundation and the wonderful projects that they can do. So those, those watching today. Um, uh, might have similar ideas and, and similar uh, people of enthusiasms for our tree canopy. Thanks, Doug, that, and we appreciate that, the community foundation's work. Does that include Stinchcomb? Because of the, uh, the majority of Stinchcomb is actual water trust, we hope the evolution. Okay. What, what we get from this, uh, from this gift, we will get the software and the hardware for us to maintain and expand it going forward. So we'll be able to start doing our own inventory uh, because we will get a quality software package out of this as well. So we will be able to go back in in those areas that we don't get to with this particular gift. We will be able to start doing our own inventories as we go forward. And, and we'll be able to map out every tree that gets planted will get categorized and put into the system. So we will be able to maintain this record keeping going forward. All right, Doug, thank you, and we appreciate the help. All right, um, Meg, you wanted to talk about G2? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to mention this is the uh, final plans and specifications being advertised for bid for the quiet zone. So we're really moving along. I hope to have this completed um, in early 2016. All right. Any other comments or questions on the consent docket? Mayor, I'd like to make a comment about E. Um, it, it has to do with... Uh, uh, a continuum of care operating agreement with the OKC Metro Allowance. I'm sure most of you know uh, my long-term involvement with the First Step Metro Allowance Program. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, it's just, uh, I just can't let it go by without uh, commenting on what a great job it does and, and how many lives it saves. Um, it's just a, it's a great organization, and uh, I'm pleased that we're still able to continue to add things to the to the buy as we go down the line. All right, thank you. And uh, Sarge wants to talk about item U, which is uh, 
the city's purchase of land for the uh, MAPS 3 Convention Center. Uh, yeah, this is Joe Sars Nelson, by the way. Uh, the items here that seem to be kind of in conjunction with last week's, as you can tell here that I spoke about, and I noticed on the formal Journal of Council proceedings that everybody spoke about concerning those lands, it has everything in it that everybody spoke about and everything, but I was just a little curious as to why it didn't have mine in there, but then again, I create too much heat down here. Uh, I did speak to some concerns in reference to the properties in question, and uh, along with the budget they were talking about, being $1.5 billion and how it goes up and down like a yo-yo, as I brought that up too, and they were told in, we were also told that we were going out of a set of expenditures in connection with these properties of around with a budget of around uh, three billion dollars, I said we're sitting on one point five billion now. I don't know how well we're going to pay for all this. Rampant six hundred two thousand two hundred twenty people that are on the tax rolls to even pay such a thing. And uh, I guess my biggest problem is I gave uh, my councilman two envelopes last week. I had hopes uh, he was able to follow up on it because they are in connection with those properties. Did you? Uh, Managed to handle anything along that line? We turned it over to legal. You turned it over to legal. Very good. That's what I wanted to hear. Uh, I'll step down right now. Next uh, Tuesday, uh, for the benefit of the council and for some of you legal eagles up there, there's three of you, uh, instead of just talking about items in question, I'll put the names with the items. And then I've got some other things that I'd like to ask the council, but I'll do it at that time. That'd be, that'd be more appropriate. For the council. Right now we're, we're dealing with the consent docket, but thanks. All right, we have a motion and a second. Are we ready to vote the consent docket? Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. And we're on to the concurrence docket. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any comments or questions on the two items in the concurrence docket? All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item nine is items that require a separate vote. First has to do with the MAPS-3 streetcar route. And Mike Mize will begin the presentations. We also have representatives from Jacobs here this morning to, to assist him. Uh, Mayor, council members, uh, Manager Couch, thank you. Um, I'm going to do just a very brief um, summary of the original budget and where we are with respect to the original budget and how what you're going to hear from Jacobs today about a potential convention center extension would fit into the current budget and where we are. Um, some of you were not on council when the original implementation plan was passed. Um, council uh, allocated $128 million in total to the modern streetcar project. That really had three components. Um, one of the components was $10 million to go to the, uh, the hub. That money has been allocated to the hub and is part of that process right now. Um, and then there was a phase one which we expected to get four to five miles of Tra mainline track and the beginnings of a downtown uh, circulator. We believe that we are very much on track for that right now. There was also a phase two allocated of about eight million dollars. There was never any um, um, particular phase two that was described. A number of things were uh, talked about as possibilities. Um, what we believe is that the the proposed extension uh, to meet the current convention center does in fact get us a phase two because what you will see today is a, an extension that serves the convention center and becomes its own separate route. So in effect, it becomes the phase two that had originally been proposed and thought about as part of the original implementation plan. So the total amount of money that was available 
um, and still is available is the 128 less the 10 that's gone to the hub. Um, when Jacobs makes its presentation today regarding the um, different possibilities and, and alternates that they um, reviewed and which have been reviewed by the subcommittee and by the advisory board, um, they're going to talk about um, additional cost uh, for some of these. That additional cost is relative to the total $128 million. Some of the options that they're going to show would have no additional cost over the $128 million. Some are uh, about at the $128 million. There's one at $3 million, and there are some that are considerably more. So, for example, the $3 million uh, addition would require $131 million as opposed to the $128 million, which is currently allocated. Are there any questions? How did this go through the vote on the subcommittee and the advisory board? Um, the, the Jacobs will provide to this morning the same presentation that they made to both the subcommittee and the advisory board. Jacobs will make a recommendation this morning. That recommendation um, flowed through the uh, subcommittee and the advisory board, and my recollection is that in both cases that was a unanimous vote. Okay. okay. Thank you. Morning, Mr. Mayor, City Morning. Council members. Doug Smith, Jacobs Engineering, Project Manager on the Streetcar Project. So, um, to walk you through our process here, get our slides going. We developed a list of criteria that we wanted to vet with the various stakeholder groups, and we wanted their comments on that criteria. So, that was the start of our process. We then went to a first level screening, first with the MAPS staff and the program <coughs> management staff there. And we talked to Embark since they were going to have to operate the system and got their opinions about uh, the, first, the first level of options that we looked at. We also had a workshop with the convention center and other consulting teams such as the park team and some of the other projects in the area to make sure that we had all their comments and thoughts about how it would integrate with their projects. And we also took a first level draft of route alternatives to the transit subcommittee to get their, their um, uh, thoughts about what, what didn't look good initially and what we should continue to study. We sub subsequently met with the subcommittee again with uh, the recommendation that we're bringing to you today. So then we went out and, and collected more data about, about traffic and utilities and some of the technical items and we did a more detailed evaluation of some selected routes which we'll tell you more about in a minute. We came up with some recommendations. We're developing a decision document to, docu to, to record all of that. And then we have a recommended alternative for selection, which is the item for you today. So the evaluation criteria included how accessible it is to other features in the system. For example, uh, we, wanted, we knew we wanted to serve the convention center well. And so how, how well does it serve that hotel location and the convention center? And of course, we have the new park down there as well. And, and how well does it integrate with those projects? So obviously, flowing people in and out and, and to other areas of the city, how well does that work? Um, operations was an important factor, of course, to, so that we understand uh, how well it fits in with the planned operation we had for, for the existing alignment that we're working on the design of. The technical considerations is just traffic utilities I mentioned, but also how much right-of-way is available to be able to do what we want to do, going down Robinson, going across the boulevard, that kind of thing. And how does it impact our existing schedule? And we're, we're hoping for an open day in 2018, so how would it impact that? And of course, the phase one construction schedule, um, how well would it integrate with that? And, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. And of course, the cost, which Mike already talked about a little bit. When we met with the stakeholder groups, there were some considerations that they told us were important to them that we should include in, in, the, in the evaluation of the alternatives. And one was serve the hotel. It's at the corner of Robinson and the Boulevard, and they felt serving that intersection was one of the most important features of, of diverting this route. Also, um, getting a service from the hotel directly to and from Bricktown, they thought was an important feature because people would come 
into Oklahoma City. They would stay at that hotel and we wanted them to be able to circulate quickly and easily in and out of Bricktown. Also, um, we looked at Shields as an alternative. I'll, I'll tell you more about that in, in a second. But we knew that there were going to be challenges with traffic at Shields and congestion here because it does have the I-40 on-ramp there. And, and so that was a concern. Also, it would be ideal if we could only add one more vehicle to the vehicle order that we're working on right now with Brookville. So um, if, we could, if we could only buy one more, then that would be a benefit. Of course, the, the remaining budget that we had in the program, Mike was just speaking about the budget, but we should do as much as we possibly can within the remaining budget that we had in the project. And uh, I already mentioned the, the phase one schedule and implementation. And then finally, what the impacts to other projects, such like especially the park, what would it do to that project cost, how it would it impact its schedule, and the functionality of the park that was planned. So these are some options that, based on those considerations that were voiced, that we dropped from our analysis. Uh, first of all, option two um, goes south on Shields, down to the boulevard and across. And because of those traffic concerns, in Shields, and we had another option to use Robinson to get down to the boulevard. We said that's not, um, that's not a superior option, so we dropped it from further study. Option six, similarly to use Shields, but we went all the way down to 4th Street, which would cut between the hotel and the convention center facilities, and there, there's uh, some major utilities in 4th Street, and we still have the traffic concerns in Shields, so we dropped it from further analysis. Option eight, was one to continue all the way down Robinson, but to cut, cut through the south end of the park. Um, when meeting with the park consultant, we heard concerns about the functionality of the park at the south end. We needed two trains to be able to develop a route. You see there's a red line on the map, which represents the circulation, which go down through the, the south end of the park, back up Hudson, and cutting back around through the downtown area, either using Kerr or Park to cut across, and then circulate out into Bricktown so it's a longer route, and would require more trains. So we thought we had other options that were superior to that. And then finally, option 10, which was a tail track to go down Robinson, serve the intersection of the boulevard and 3rd Street, uh, or the boulevard and Robinson, and then continue on south and cut across the south end of the park to get to the existing maintenance facility site. Again, because of the concerns about the park, there's some concerns about um, utilities in, in Robinson on the south mound there. So we dropped that for further consideration. Now we'd like to tell you about the options we did consider in more detail. So Lee Nichols on our team will uh, continue then. Okay. Good morning. I'm Lee Nichols, senior planner with AECOM. Uh, I want to walk you through. Here are the routes that we did the detailed evaluation on. And with any um, kind of route analysis or alter alternatives analysis, we always want to use a baseline alternative. So our baseline for this evaluation was the existing phase one main line with no change. Um, as you may know, it's about four, just over four and a half miles. Um, with this route, there's no new construction, no additional vehicles, so there's no added cost to the route. Now some pros and cons, um, again, like I mentioned, there's no additional cost vehicles or schedule impacts, um, but there are a few negatives. It doesn't have that direct connection from the Convention Center Hotel to Bricktown. There's approximately a 800 foot walk um, from the Convention Center Hotel to the route on Reno. And then a rider would need to transfer, whether it be Sheridan, walk across Myriad Gardens, or ride the street all the way up to 4th Street to transfer to get into Bricktown. Our uh, next option is uh, option three, which is the boulevard reroute with Sheridan Turnback. Now this creates two separate routes. We'll call it the blue route and the red route. The blue route is just, a, is about four point, just under 4.9 miles, and it's a, it's a little modification of the existing phase one route, where we have the deviation from Reno that goes south on Robinson from Reno to the new boulevard, and then back north on Hudson. Now the dashed line you see on the map is what would be removed from our existing phase one design. So that blue route would still maintain the 10, 12 minute headways. And then the red route you see also has a deviation um, south on Robinson to the boulevard, which you know both routes would serve the front door of the park and also the uh, convention center hotel. But we'd add the track on Sheridan to create what we're calling the Bricktown Loop. 
So this red route would have a, a, a headway of about 15 minutes and would require one additional vehicle. Um, so the additional funds needed, so when everything's all said and done, we need about an additional $3 million on top of the $128 million that's already been allocated for the streetcar. So that would bring the total budget to $131 million. Uh, pros, it does provide that direct connection to and from uh, the Convention Center Hotel and the MAPS 3 Park to Bricktown and Midtown. Uh, it gives embarks some flexibility on the red route on whether they want to operate it full-time or part-time. Since it is just the Bricktown loop, they could run it um, for special events when there's conventions going on. They could run it for a year full-time to see how it is and then adjust it. So it really gives the embark the flexibility to help manage their O&M costs in the long term. In addition, um, in front of the park and the hotel, you would have seven minute headways that would be serving Bricktown. So every seven minutes in that area, there would be a train coming by and the rider would have the option of, do I want to go into Midtown or do I want to go into Bricktown? And with the design, with the new boulevard going in, there's some excess right away. So we do have the opportunity to potentially use, put the train in its own dedicated lane so it would be out of mixed traffic along the boulevard. Some negatives with this route, uh, there are some potential utility impacts along Robinson. Um, if we do not use the dedicated lane for the streetcar, the streetcar would be constructed within the new boulevard, so it would be tearing up the boulevard that's just been recently uh, constructed. And also there is the additional $3 million um, needed to complete this option. Option four is our single service route. Now this is just one route. It's modification to the existing uh, route that's been approved where it would continue south on Robinson all the way to the boulevard, uh, go east to Shields, north on Shields slash EK Gaylord to Sheridan, then continue through Bricktown. And what comes out of Bricktown on Reno, it goes south on Shields to the boulevard, and then west to Hudson, and then north up to Midtown. This route would be about just about 5.4 miles. Uh, we just need one additional vehicle to maintain the 10 to 12, 10 to 12 minute headways, but we need about an additional $12 million to implement this. Um, some pros, it does provide that direct connection to and from the Convention Center Hotel, the MAPS 3 Park to Bricktown with one single route and one additional train. Um, some negatives, um, there would be a significant schedule impact to our existing uh, design and construction schedule. Uh, utility, potential utility impacts along Robinson. Um, also, since Shields is a major road in and out of downtown to I-40, there would be some traffic and utility impacts along Shields, that's a concern. Um, with the construction of the Project 180 improvements in front of the Intermodal Hub and also the Intermodal Hub improvements, by shifting the track from the, we currently have it designed for the southbound uh, lane on EK Gaylord in front of the hub, it'd be shifted to the northbound lane. So this would require some redesign and schedule impacts to those improvements on Gaylord. And potentially it could impact the Intermodal Hub Tiger Grant. The environmental clearance was cleared to go south on um, Gaylord. By moving that track to the north side, we'd have to get with the uh, FTA to see what would need to be done to environmentally clear it going to the north. It could be it could be nothing. It could be a simple reevaluation. We just don't know. But there could be some impacts with the Tiger Grant. Um, also, um, one of the goals was to when we over future implementation of connecting the Oklahoma Health Science Center to potentially the Capitol Hill, having, the, having that route, that route would not directly serve the front door of the hub. It would require transfers needed if those two yellow line, yellow dash lines were uh, completed. Uh, option five is our storage and maintenance facility relocation. Now the blue line would stay the same, it would be no change, but we'd add a second, a red line, uh, would be just over two and a half miles. It would require one additional vehicle to maintain a 15 minute headway, but the route would again have the Bricktown loop that would you know, use uh, Sheridan to connect Hudson to, uh, add Sheridan between Hudson and Robinson to create the Bricktown loop. And we'd also double track Robinson 
um, south, and the maintenance facility would be relocated from the current east side, west side of the park to the east side of the park. Now, additional funds to complete this would be an additional $18.5 million on top of the 128 already allocated. Um, the pros, it does have that direct connection from the Convention Center Hotel and the park to Bricktown, but a transfer would be required if, if a rider wanted to go into the CBD, Automobile Alley, or Midtown. Um, there are some um, schedule impacts to the park because with double track and on Robinson, it may cause them to want to reprogram what they're doing on the park since they you know, wanted the on-street parking on the east side of the park for potential uh, O&M revenue for the park. So we'd have to look at the schedule impacts there. And also the maintenance facility schedule will be um, greatly impacted. It would require a complete redesign of the maintenance facility, uh, property acquisition for the new site, building demolition. There could be some hazmat concerns. And also the access from 7th to the proposed location of the maintenance facility could be difficult because of the grades there when you're transitioning off Robinson to 7th to get to the site. And as I mentioned, there's a transfer required for a rider to get to Midtown or CBD or Automobile Alley. And again, the $18.5 million to implement. Option 7A is what we're calling the Bricktown turnaround using Kerr. Uh, again, it's the, the blue line stays the same. Uh, we'd add the disc second route, which is one would, but this one would require two additional vehicles to maintain the 15 minute headways. But the route would again, you know, deviate south from Reno to the boulevard and then go north on Hudson to Kerr, where it would create the turnaround to create the Bricktown Loop. This would be, require additional, just over $7 million to implement. Uh, pros, again, has a direct connection to uh, the Convention Center Hotel and, and the Central Business District, but a transfer is required to get into Midtown, and there's no schedule impacts uh, for the Phase 1 mainline where we're at today. Um, negatives, there are potential utility impacts along Robinson. Uh, there's some significant engineering challenges along Kerr. We're not certain if we could actually put a track there. We'd have to look at that in greater detail. Again, the two additional vehicles that is needed and the um, higher operating costs since you're not only running, you're running, you're running the two vehicles and, and a longer route. 7B is very, very similar to 7A. Instead of using curb, we're using park to make the turnaround. Again, uh, two additional vehicles and, a, and the same seven, just over $7 million to implement. Same pros and cons, uh, transfer required if a rider wanted to get into Midtown, um, utility impacts on Robinson, um, and then there's also some significant e engineering challenges there on, on, par, uh, on Park to put in the streetcar. Uh, 9A is our Robinson tail track. What this does is it creates a Bricktown loop losing Sheridan and Reno, but on Robinson South of Reno we're double tracking then the streetcar would turn into 4th Street to uh, actually turn around, where the vehicle would stop and dwell, and riders, you know, the, the, the driver would get off of one side of the train, walk to the other side of the train, and patrons would load and unload. Um, again, it's a separate route with one additional vehicle, 15-minute headways on the red route, but it would require about an additional $8 million to implement. Um, pros, it does provide that direct connection to the Convention Center, Hotel, and Bricktown. It gives Embark the ability to turn cars around. What this means is the way the currently route is laid out, the vehicle is consistently using one side of the vehicle um, for doors opening and closing. By having this tail track, it essentially turns the car around so you're using the opposite side as the route continues. So it could potentially lower some of the O&M costs in the long term on the vehicles. Um, it does give Embark the, the flexibility to run this full part-time service. Uh, negatives, you know, that we get some utility concerns along Robinson and on 4th. Uh, a transfer is required to get into Midtown, the Central Business District, and Automobile Alley, and additional, and again, the additional $8 million to implement. 9B is a Robinson single track. It's, it's pretty essentially the same as 9A. But instead of double tracking Robinson and using fourth, this would just be a single track on Robinson from um, basically the new boulevard to Sheridan that would 
Uh, well, south of Reno would run north-south on that track, and north of Reno just run northbound. Uh, again, one additional vehicle, 15-minute headways, an additional $2.5 million is needed to implement this one. Same pros and cons as 9A. Uh, it does give them bark to flexibility on how they want to operate the service full or part-time. There are the utility impact concerns on Robinson, um, and then the transfer is required if a patron wants to go somewhere other than Midtown. I mean, uh, somewhere other than Bricktown, sorry. And again, the additional $2.5 million to implement. 12A, option 12A is our Bricktown loop using Sheridan. This is a, a separate operating line, uh, the red line, that would just run a loop on Sheridan and Reno in and out of Bricktown. And this one would just require, again, one additional vehicle, 15-minute headways, and an additional million dollars needed to implement. Now, the pros, uh, it does have the connection to the hotel, to the center hotel, but it's not a direct connection. There's a approximately 800-foot walk uh, from the hotel to get to Reno to access the line. But once there, the patron, the rider would have the opportunity to go take the red line into Bricktown or take the blue line um, north into the system, whether it be out of the alley, Midtown, or the CBD. And on top of the additional million dollars to implement, um, we have a uh, currently designed as a, on Joe Carter's a terminus point where the vehicles would actually pull out of service and dwell to give the rider a break. It's kind of our end of line area. Uh, it's a bid option currently in our design plans, but with this option, it would be required not only to give the vehicle a chance to dwell in the, in the driver to take a break, but also as a passing track because you're operating two, two uh, routes on the same line. So that would be required in this option. Um, also, it gives Embark the flexibility to run this full or part-time as with uh, a couple of the other options. 12B, uh, essentially the same, but instead of going all the way to Hudson and using Sheridan to create the Bricktown Loop, we're just going up Robinson to Sheridan in the Bricktown Loop. is a little smaller. Um, this would be about additional, just under half a million dollars to implement. Again, one additional vehicles. Um, the pros and cons are the same. The biggest one being the 800-foot walk that's needed to uh, get access from the hotel to the route. Now, we came up with three viable options based on, on the cost that's needed to implement. For an additional million dollars, uh, we'd recommend option 12A, the Bricktown Loop, using Sheridan. Um, for additional $3 million, we recommend option 3, the Boulevard Reroute with the Sheridan Turnaround. And then for additional MAPS 3 commitment of $12 million, we'd recommend option 4, which is a single service route. Now, through our detailed evaluation, we do recommend option three, the Boulevard reroute with the Sheridan Turnback. Again, it has two routes, route one being 4.86 miles, route two being two, just over two miles, for a total service route just under seven miles for the two routes. We need additional $3 million to implement, but we feel this not only serves the visitors to the convention center, but also the residents of Oklahoma City and the downtown workers, because it not only provides that direct connection to the convention center hotel, but it provides a direct connection on both routes to the MAPS 3 park. So somebody could easily park on the north side in an album alley, um, take the train if they want to go to an event at the park or the Chesapeake, park in the north, ride the streetcar down to the south. Um, it gives them bark the flexibility of when they want to run full part-time service so they can help manage their O&M costs in the long term. And plus it gives the option we could actually take the streetcar out of the mixed traffic on the boulevard to get in its own dedicated lane. And the, this route also serves uh, very well the existing municipal structured parking that's currently in place. So with that, I'd be glad to answer any questions or comments that you may have. Um, why don't you hang tight, and I know Jeff Bezdek is here who serves on the subcommittee, and I'd like to get Jeff's opinions on this, and maybe he can reflect on the subcommittee's opinions after reviewing the um, options that were presented by the consultant. Thanks, Lee. 
Um, well, I would say that we entered this process with a great deal of trepidation because this was quite a curveball thrown to us. I mean, worked very hard to come up with the route that has already been presented and approved through council. So making a major change to shift further to the south um, was quite stressful. But in the end, the option that's being presented to you by the consultants uh, was selected unanimously by the committee. And there were some concerns about uh, future growth to Capitol Hill, how to best connect to Capitol Hill, and whether or not modifications to this line would accommodate that. Uh, we feel confident that the connection down Walker in the future uh, meets the plan that's already been put forth by ACOG and uh, reduces the economic impact to the funds in MAPS 3. So that was a major concern. Uh, Lee brought up another major concern, which is uh, O&M. You know, the streetcar system will not work if it uh, is not efficient and does not have frequency. It will not work. It will not attract riders. And one of our concerns by adding an additional line is we might potentially increase that O&M cost and there may be a desire by a future council or by the Embark Board to reduce frequency, whether that's on the main line or on the circulator. Um, so that's a long-term concern that our committee can't contend with. We do have proposals that are not within the budget yet that we will be coming to you in the future asking for your consideration that are above and beyond our, our budget, namely uh, advertising revenues and looking at how that may affect long-term O&M and mitigate the cost. Of course, that may have other implications to the bus system as well and savings there. But um, we're confident in the design. And one thing that needs to be pointed out is the uh, flexibility, while it may affect us O&M-wise and may affect us frequency-wise, depending on these future administrations, uh, this line is actually quite brilliant in that as the intermodal hub gains uh, relevance, and future commuter trains come in the Emerald Hub, we can essentially short circuit the line. So the, uh, the blue line, for example, that makes the full route can be shifted uh, to go in front of Santa Fe Station so that commuters coming in, future commuter trains, can more easily connect to the CBD without having to make the trip through Bricktown. Whereas the Bricktown line can be isolated to serve primarily visitors and tourists. And uh, that offers some operational flexibility to the long-term goals that the council has for a regional transit system and how the streetcar might plug into it. Um, like I said, unanimous approval on both boards. Um, I do have something for you today I'm going to leave with you, which was a great op-ed piece in the New York Times last week. Um, our consultants worked on many streetcar systems, but they also worked on uh, the Atlanta streetcar system, which has had a lot of uh, difficulties, problems with ridership, problems with frequency, problems with on-time delivery. Uh, and the Portland system, which is the gold standard for streetcars, has also had its fair share of delays and challenges. Our subcommittee wants to bring to you the best proposal, learning from all of these different cities, to build the streetcar system that people will enjoy, use, and meet the expectations of the voters. I don't think we're quite there yet, but we're almost there. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, council probably has some questions amongst some of the people that have come forward. I have a question about the interaction of the boulevard. Is, is David Todd the best person to act, ask of that? Or? We can start with David, and Eric's, okay. Eric's available also. All right. Um, I, 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 in, in looking at all these options, refresh my memory. Are, are we going to be sharing? lanes with the boulevard or are we going to have a separate lane on the boulevard for the streetcar? Well, we've got both proposals uh, being looked at right now. Okay. No um, wonder I'm confused. Well, <laughs> we yeah, we there's... Decided. We, we got preliminary drawings just yesterday and, and some of those show in the lane sharing traffic like we do on all the streets. Some of them show it over on the side in a dedicated lane kind of in the street. Another proposal is completely behind the sidewalk in a whole other corridor where the streetcar would not bother any kind of parking or traffic or anything. So we're looking at all those, those options. We have the luxury of doing that because with the boulevard, we have all that excess right away from, mm -hmm. from I-40. That's why we're able to do that. And it's, and it's new construction, so you know, we're going to be constructing any, something anyway. Right. Um, and ODOT's working with us. How is that working? Is, yeah, Eric, you want to address that? Is, 
Thank you, Mayor. Yes, we're actually having sometimes weekly meetings with ODOT as we finish up the boulevard design. Right now, the section that uh, it's most affected by the streetcar is finishing up, and so Gaylord to Walker is the next portion that's set to bid, and they'd like to put that out just as soon as possible. So they're actively waiting to see what the council's decision is and what some of the designs will come from the new streetcar route to the convention center. We have the ability through the design and the bid. If we need to, we can do change orders during construction. So perhaps if the streetcar is aligned inside the actual boulevard proper, we can probably have some temporary paving put in if needed so that it can be pulled out easily. So, but ultimately, it would be a concrete section like we would see in most of our downtown areas once it's in its final form. So whether the track is in the boulevard or, say, north of the boulevard in the right-of-way, some of the excess right-of-way, they are able to accommodate. It, you know, I, I guess the critical question for me is, I mean, I, I like the idea of a separated corridor for the, for the streetcar, but I'm also concerned about, you know, widening the corridor and making it less pedestrian friendly. So how do you, how does a person who's designing the street, how does a person take all of that into consideration and come up with some, something that's workable? So the boulevard was already intended to be very pedestrian friendly. So it has 15 foot sidewalks on both the north and the south sides. So on the south side, obviously being the new MAPS 3 park, that's something that's already going to be integrated with a park with a wide walkway. The north side is going to have the same. Simply as part of the streetcar project, we'll integrate the tracks with that as well. So whether they go through crosswalks on the boulevard, we'll design it much like we've done with 180, keeping the pedestrian in mind. Okay. And, and we're talking about the north side of the, of the boulevard, right, for the streetcar? I think we're yes, following sir. MAPS's lead. That's, that looks like the side that it's going to be on, and, and there's multiple options right now. Okay. All right. Uh, rest of the council probably has questions for somebody. But, you know, feel free to let yeah, us know who you want. i got a question to. for uh, Mr. Todd. Okay. Uh, last week on the agenda, I think I remember, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that we looked at or we purchased some steel for the rail line. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Well, okay. it, yeah, we've, we've authorized it. Yeah, we authorized it, and, and we were able to ha have some savings uh, just because the price of steel was down right now. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Are there other areas that, if, if we were to elect option three, are there other areas that we can look at for saving costs? <clears throat> well, we're always trying to do that. Um, but any of the specific that come to mind as we sit here today? Nothing specific. Yeah, you know, I might refer to, to Doug if he's got any ideas, but, but like you said, we, we constantly look for those opportunities to, to save. and. and you know, one of them might be what we're talking about by putting the, the track behind the boulevard. You know, I just refer you to the, the picture that's still up on the screen. This is uh, an example of, of something that's right in the middle of the pedestrian area. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Yeah, Pete. I, I, I'm sure everybody else understands this, but, but I want to tell me exactly where this money, this $3 million is coming from. Understand it comes from the Oklahoma City Capital Improvement Sales Tax Fund, but is, is that fund specific to, to a contingency for the streetcar, yeah. or is it taking it out of the general contingency for the entire It's product? the program, the general contingency, the 10.4 that's still remaining. For the streetcar? Yes, sir. What, for, for the program to be used for the streetcar. It's the, the overall contingency that, okay. that was in the program. Is the $128 million that was on the bond, I mean on the sales tax election. Yes, sir. Is this in excess of that $128 million? Yes, sir. And it's coming from the, the program? The, the general, the, the money that's been generated in excess of what we budgeted? No, we, there's a contingency in our budget of originally eight, is it 18? 17 million. 17, 17 million dollars was put in there as a contingency. Now, it, sales tax has exceeded recommendations. You could say it's coming from that, but basically inside the MAPS 3 budget there was 17 million dollars for contingency. It would be coming out of that. Did that come from the original budgeted amounts that we put before the public? Yes. But it was for any MAPS project. That's correct. Right. So if this is added, this the streetcar will have spent the home 28 plus 3. Is that right? Yes, sir. Um, and out of the contingency fund. It just seems fund, to me. Sorry. What? Out of the contingency fund, we have a, remain, a remainder of 10.4 million. Right. That's correct. Okay. Well, it's, it, you know, we, we, have, we have sales tax revenues in, in, that exceed our projections. 
We also have some interest income that's come in, and then we have leftovers monies from the original contingency account. Yeah. So we're talking an addition. We're, there's tens of millions of dollars above and beyond what we originally budgeted back in 2009. That's correct. Well, as as a poor a predictor of I am as I am of things that. I, uh, I think if it's now 128 million and it's going to 131 and we haven't done anything other than talk so far, we can anticipate this will be grossly above the 128 million before we're through. It just seems it's not logical that to assume that it's not going to really go over budget badly. We don't know that. Uh, I mean, hmm? There's been some history along those lines. We're bringing the streetcars in where we think the streetcars are, are going to come in, which is a big piece of, of, of the program that will be put to bed within the next few weeks. On that, we're, we bought the steel, so we've got a handle on, on, on the steel costs. Well, yes, there are construction risks that are still our, out there, but... Our, our track record is not that they come in. They come in with all these contingencies, and at a time when our revenues are going down, uh, and that means the amount that's going into MAPS 3 contingency is going to be going down, um, I, I, I'm struck with that. I mean, you, everybody, if everybody else is okay with it, I mean, that's okay. But, um, you know, I just think about, I think about the improvements we've made in our bus service and how much of an improvement we could have made if we'd have paid the same amount of attention and invested the same amount of money in this. We're talking about worrying about 15-minute headways for somebody to work downtown to live in an apartment that's a couple thousand dollars a month and we're not even worried enough to even continue a serious conversation about people that don't have the money that live in the suburbs that have to work at minimum wage jobs and ride a bus that, that is much more reliable today than it was five years ago but it's sure as heck not 15 minute headways with covered i just i i, I uh, if I have a regret of being a councilman for since 1982, it is voting for this. This this project is so is so much the antithesis of what I think Oklahoma City ought to be doing for its citizens. And I I just I want to I'm going to eat a little humble pie here today and tell you that I, this is the biggest mistake I've made as a councilman to vote for this. Uh, I I don't know anything to do but continue to feed the beast, but. Uh, um, it just, I just worry that it is a, we're going to really regret this as we move forward. Just the O&M comments, we already know that the, the o and is going to be $10 per rider based on, based on the amount of deficit we project it'll run and the amount of num number of riders we have. Nobody would do that. None of us would do that in our own business to project a, a project that you had to subsidize $10 per ride. And we can only hope nobody rides it. I, I just, uh, I, may not, I may quit coming to meetings where we have this on the agenda anymore. It just makes me sick at my stomach to think of what we've done and what we do to people that, that uh, can't afford, um, they can't afford to, they can't live on what they make after they get to work, and, and we just ignore them. Right. I'm, I'm, gonna, yeah. I, I'm, I'm planning on voting against this resolution, not because the option three is a bad option, because I certainly think it's the best option uh, if um, you value connect, directly connecting to the convention center and the park, um, which I can certainly see the value of that. but. I don't think that, that, to me, it's not worth $9 million, which is actually what it's going to cost. It's just $3 million over the, over the budget. Um, uh, so that's, to me, asking somebody to walk 800 feet to, to get to the, uh, to to the streetcar is not worth $9, $9 million. So, right. um, because... Uh, Along those lines, uh, I, I mean, I think it's reasonable that there will be cost overruns of something, whether it's the convention center or, or anything else. And at the end of the day, we'll be assigning things on different sides of the ledger. 
it seems like this $3 million should be assigned to the convention center ledger at, at least as much as the streetcar. I mean, we're going to, we're altering the route, we're abandoning any, any dream of a phase two expansion to the health science center or anywhere else to get down to the convention center. I, I, I think we heard 25 times about the convention center hotel. That, it, that it's happening. I mean, there was no if a convention center hotel. I mean, I heard in this presentation, between the two presentations, the term convention center hotel about 25 times. So I guess the first question would be, when you were talking to stakeholders, I mean, is it, was it presented to you that that's a, that's a done deal, that that's a maybe, that that's a 50% chance that, that we need to, to create a line for a convention center hotel? When we were meeting with the consultant team for the convention center uh, and the park, it was, it was one meeting, the convention center folks said their primary goal was to get to the site where the convention center hotel would be, which would be that corner of Robinson and the New Boulevard. Did, did, they, did they indicate that there might be a chance the convention center hotel wouldn't happen or that it was, it was definitely going to happen? They didn't say whether it was definitely going to happen or not going to happen. They just said that was a preferred location, was where the site, where they're planning for the site to be, is where they'd like the streetcar to reach. What, what, what would be the distance from, if you extended from the northern part of the existing route to get to the Health Science Center? The Health Science Center, the, basically to go from, I can flip to a map here, I can, um, we'll just go. Basically, to get from, from, from Broadway to just uh, under you know, 235, almost to, to Lincoln, uh, is, a, I think, just under a half a mile. So if you're looking all the way to the Health Science Center, you're probably looking at anywhere from additional probably two miles. I'm trying to go off of memory here because we have looked at that in the past when we did the initial route analysis. So um, it would be two miles there and two miles back, or if you single tracked it, you could do a two mile. It would it would have to be as we're showing here. It would have to be double tracked because that length um, you, you, to do a single track you you couldn't do because it would take um, a good 15 20 minutes to make that entire circuit. Uh, so a single track wouldn't, wouldn't work. So that's why we have it double tracked on 4th and then on Lincoln uh, to, I think it's 8th Street, to get into the Health Science Center, make the loop, and then come back down. Uh, so it would, you would have to have the double track on 4th and on Lincoln south of 8th. So what what would the total distance of that? Uh, I want to say that whole route and the, the distance Track miles, is, I think, is around four track miles. Okay. So, uh, this, so today we're voting for something that's basically half of that. We could have got 50% of the Health Science Center. No, I, I don't think so, no. Okay. No. Why? Just engineering challenges and in 4th Street, I, I don't, you know, we're really, we're only adding probably New construction is, is about a, a third of a mile, 0.3 miles. Um, so, and that, and that's basically you're adding three blocks. Uh, so you would, and double tracking on fourth, you could maybe get the deep dues with what we're showing here. So did you ever budget out getting to the Health Science Center? We have in the alternatives analysis that was completed a few years ago. And in looking at our initial route planning for the, the, the main line that was proposed, we looked at how far potentially the funds could go um, if we did the full phase. Based on the budget at the time back in 2013, um, I think what we could would have gotten was either, how we presented it was either you could do, um, and this was again back when the original route was proof, uh, uh, approved in 2013, we could either get the Hudson Walker Loop with any phase two funds or along 4th Street um, just to the west of 235 was about as far as you could get. So what, what was the total budget for the Health Science Center Loop? I don't recall. Uh, 
to I was on the health science committee uh, for alternatives analysis. To do the health science center line is around a $120 million project in itself to properly serve the medical district and get up in the northeast side. We believe that is the most eligible line for federal funding. And as you know, Congress has recently approved uh, major landmark uh, legislation for transportation funding, of which transit is a major component of that for Oklahoma specifically. Uh, I believe, as a committee member, that that is the most likely line to be funded through um, federal funds and potentially some city supplemental funds. Uh, but also, um, we need to look at how to expand it farther. The alignment that they've come up with in this option three provides for keeping the southbound track in front of Santa Fe Station which would uh, help facilitate that line in the future and could possibly be used in some sort of matching grant scenario. Okay. So the Brookings Institute is doing their study of Health Science Center. And I think it's very important that the streetcar system and the alternatives analysis be factored into that. Any future maps, uh, monies that may be uh, proposed, uh, if, if Brookings and the economic development plan for that area is pursued. But unfortunately, in MAPS 3, we do not have, uh, the, the phase two was a, a, a cash flow construct. It was created not to expand the streetcar, but to allow all of the projects and MAPS to be distributed over a broader timeline. Rather than have the full expense of the streetcar program up front, or we, we parred it out and called it phase two, um, but in our minds as subcommittee members, that was always contingency money. There, there was never a physical phase two, but it did cause confusion. I, I, I mean, I think there were some discussions of possibility of a physical phase two. When, when did the 120 million figure, when do, I've never heard that figure before as an estimate to get to the Health Science Center. Uh, that came out of the all alternatives analysis process, okay. and that is to build the entire line and get up to where the people are, which is, uh, what is that center street through the, is that Young's or? Um, I think that's Young. Yes. Yeah, I think it's Young's. So the problem with Health Science Center is it's a suburban campus design. Right. We have giant parking lots separating buildings. So to properly cover that entire area, you have to cover a, a fair amount of land with track. And the densest part of Health Science Center is uh, in Young's by, by Children's and the Biomed Research Facility. And so without getting up there, making a simple leg to get over to Health Science Center, um, unfortunately, just creates an operational burden that isn't justified unless we do the entire thing. OK. Well, let's, let's get back to what's being proposed today. I appreciate that. And I, the 12B, 12B would cost, what, $300,000, option 3B? That's, and that's the one that involves an 800-foot walk by the, those from the Convention Center Hotel. Yes, sir. So that, that would accomplish, that would accomplish everything, basically, except for the 800-foot walk. That's correct. So, in a, in essence, we're paying $2.7 million to eliminate the 800-foot walk to a convention center hotel, which may or may not happen. And keep in mind that not only is it, I guess, it also connects, provides the front door service to the MAPS 3 Park. So we know that's going in. So it, it, I know we've been mentioning the convention center hotel because it's the reason for the study. But with this option three that we're proposing, it does give that front door service to the park also. One of the other things that was mentioned also is that it connects some major city garages and gives them better access to Bricktown. I just want to remind you of that. Yeah, it, it helps promote that park once mentality where you can park once, get where you need to go within downtown, whether it's shopping, business, uh, going to a game. It promotes park once mentality within downtown. So, I mean, 800 feet is like, what, 15% of a mile? I mean, it's, it's. It's, a, it's, it's basically, it's one of those super blocks here. I mean, it's certainly well within what we expect people to ride on our, 
our transit system, I mean, to walk on our transit system. To yes. Do, do you think that's a significant impediment? Typically for transit, the, the walk capture is about a quarter mile from the station. And that would fall, again, within the quarter mile. What's that, Jeff? The, the problem with the 800 feet argument is that it's headed the wrong way. It's 800 feet, a super block distance to get to Reno. But your trams, your streetcars, are headed up to um, where we're at right now, City Hall and, and up into Midtown. So your visitors and your tourists, who we rely on these tax dollars, are headed in a, a different direction than uh, the convention center uh, hotels, which are located in Bricktown and where our, our, our Bricktown district is. So the challenge is you're not talking about 800 foot walk to get there, you're actually talking about having to walk all the way to Sheridan, which is what, another, another 400 from, feet? Yeah, from, at least. from that corner of Robinson the Boulevard to Sheridan is about 1,600 feet. Approximately. And streetcar systems don't work, really, unless you can easily find that stop. So fi that's asking someone to, to go that distance and find the stop, which is hidden behind the Cox Convention Center. Okay. So, so to get to Sheridan takes you past that quarter mile threshold. That's right. Yes. Gotcha. And we didn't, you know, on the subcommittee, when the convention center was located, uh, and it's a it's former location um, on the parking lots between Reno and the Boulevard. We felt that we didn't need to go down that far south, um, and that people would walk to the park. Um, but shifting that, and also if you think about it, and we were going to invest between the convention center and the park over five hundred million dollars of taxpayer money in the area. You would think that. The west side of the park is also going to be activated by further economic development in the TIF district. The streetcar is not only serving the convention center and the park, but also that potential future density that's going to be generated there by the stimulation of all this taxpayer money. But the subcommittee, we're not eager to come to you and say we need three million more dollars. Well, we didn't want to do that. but. Um, generally speaking, through the oversight board and subcommittee, we felt that a good connection down that area now that so much taxpayer money is being shifted into that area is very important. Right. Larry, one, are you through, Ed? Or Larry, one to say something? Yeah, I have a ahead. couple of questions if I could. Okay. Uh, starting off, when, when I first heard about, about all the, this going on, quite frankly, I thought, let the people walk the 800 feet. But I've since changed my mind on that. One of the things that I, in my mind, see if I'm on faulty thinking on this is the fact that if there's never a convention hotel built on the site which is currently reserved for it, I still have the challenge of getting people to the convention center itself and from the convention center itself to the Bricktown Entertainment for, for meals and entertainment. Is that not true? That's correct. That's correct. So the fact that people keep talking about convention center and hotel and keep talking about hotel, we have not done a, a study completed a study on the hotel. We have not voted to build the hotel. So the, the route stands on its own, whether there's ever a hotel there or not. The second thing that comes to mind, in the Bricktown area, there, is, there has been a considerable increase in the number of hotels that have been built in that area. Is it not also reasonable that before a convention center hotel, if one is ever built, that conventioneers will be staying in those hotels and will need to get from Bricktown to the convention center for their functions and for their, for their programs. And so it fits that need. Now, the question I have, what is, if there is a, a plan to move, to expand the downtown trolley circulator route from the downtown area and midtown to the health sciences center, does this not give me the nucleus or the foundation to do that at the time we want to do that and have the monies available? Yeah. And I would like to see it eventually go to Capitol Hill. Does not this route that's being recommended also form uh, a foundation to allow me to get to Capitol Hill? Should that be a desire uh, 5, 10, 15 years in the future? Yes, it does. Okay. So I think I'm, 
to me, I'm getting my cake and eat it too. The other thing that's being thrown out here, we're talking about the amount of money that the citizens of Oklahoma City uh, are paying for this. A good portion of the monies that are being spent on the MAPS 3 projects are not coming from Oklahoma City residents. They come from sales tax that visitors coming into town generate. So we're not funding the entire thing ourselves as a citizen of Oklahoma City. And I think that needs to be uh, kept in the forefront also as we go forward. Thank you, sir. Okay. Yeah, Meg? Mayor, I guess, uh, Linda, thank you for making that point, because that was going to be my first comment as well, that there is a convention center being built, whether or not we build a hotel, and it is next door to the park. And so I really do believe we need to touch both of those uh, major investments. We are also getting a couple of additional miles. I mean, when we voted for this, we thought we might get four and a half miles, of, and we're now getting seven. Um, and we're getting two routes, and we've reduced yeah. headways um, to seven minutes for people standing at the park to get back to um, the edge, as an example. So I think we're getting a lot more for our extra dollars um, than it might sound like on the surface. Now, I, I think um, touching the structured parking garages in a better way, in a better way, makes a lot of sense. And um, the thought that went into being able to use the right of way for a dedicated lane on the boulevard, I think, is also a real bonus. So I, I want to say thank you to the consulting group for um, going through 12 or 18 or how many options you went through. And um, you know, nobody wants to spend an additional three million dollars. I think that's probably a given. But I think we get a fair amount of bang for our extra dollars. And as we've seen, some of these other bids, the steel came in 25% under budget. Um, we've had other things that have come in under. And so, you know, maybe there are savings in the total project that help meet this additional $3 million. So I'm very supportive of this choice. Okay. Can I add just one thing? So I, I agree that we're, you know, even without a hotel, you're doing it for a convention center. But I do think at the end of the day, this needs to go at least as much on the convention center side of the ledger. Going to the park, the west side of the park, all that stuff wasn't, that wasn't enough by itself to get us to do this extra $3 million deal. It was only when the convention center was chosen to put here that now all of a sudden we're doing this extra expansion. And so I, I just, $3 million, $9 million, whatever it is, I mean, at the end of the day, if there are cost overruns, I hope that we remember that we did this for the convention center. But ultimately, at the end of the day, the bigger consideration, I think, is what Jeff was alluding to. It's, $3 million is going to be, it's not the capital outlay, or Pete, I think, was sorry. It's the operations and maintenance. And I, I appreciate that, really, for the, I mean, we're starting to talk about that in these presentations. Because to me, that's $3 million every year. And that's going to come from our general fund. That's going to be completely paid by the city of Oklahoma City. Uh, $3 million a year, and I just don't see that we have a plan that, that will come anywhere close to meeting that. If I agree with anything you said, Jeff, is that the streetcar is not going to work without frequency. We know that because that, that applies to basically all transit modalities, and it's why our bus system is one of the main reasons we can't attract ridership to our bus system. So one question is, if, you know, why, if you're going to prioritize frequency on the, on the streetcar, do you not have the same feeling? prioritization for the buses. Why don't, why don't we prioritize that kind of frequency for the buses? And I just don't see any way that you're going to come up with $3 million. We're talking about two years from now with, with projected decreases in, in revenue. How you're going to come up with $3 million, and if you just put that into the COPTA budget, how you're not going to take away from existing um, transit that we have. So. It seems like we need to, with great urgency, come up with other revenue streams, debate or discuss other revenue streams. Not, we don't have a plan. I mean, advertising is not going to get us there. We, we made a policy decision not to ask developers to pay for any of this. So we have, in the past, we've studied things like gasoline tax. We've studied other options that could be considered, but I, I don't, we are, it's not a zero-sum game. It's not just we're going to get this from the streetcar. We're going to take away from other things from our existing transportation budget unless we come up with new revenues. And I just hope that we can begin to th talk about things like a gasoline tax or other ways to come up with revenue because not having a plan is, just, is not acceptable. We're only two years away. 
And that $3 million, which is going to come every single year, is going to make this $3 million seem inconsequential. Councilman, uh, you know, I'm a private citizen, but I, I just want to address that, you know, when we first campaigned for the streetcar, and what we've learned from other cities is the incredible economic return that they generate. And so I do think that one thing that is overlooked in our debates about routes and, and our discussion about it is the incredible economic return that the streetcar system could potentially generate in terms of sales tax revenue for all of the downtown area. Um, it also would allow us to think about using our land more wisely. And we uh, demolished many buildings for parking garages and we build far many we're going to have to build parking garages. I'm not saying we're not going to have to build them. But perhaps with installing the system, we can think about our land use a little more effectively and try to see a bigger return by not having to spend so much on subsidizing our automobile travel and needing these garages in every public project and every private project that's built and make more and better effective use of the garages that we already have. But I want to touch on one last thing. Um, you know, someone reacted in one of our meetings and said, we're not supposed to worry about O&M. Well, I'm worried about O&M. And I think that advertising could be a major um, offset revenue generator for not only the streetcar system, but the bus system. And when the streetcar system was first proposed, the same advocates advocated for new bus shelters at every bus stop. And since that time, technology has evolved, but our policies haven't. And I think that the streetcar system, at a minimum, should have digital signage at every stop that the city owns, that MAPS pays for in the capital expense, to generate O&M. And right now, our policy is to sublet that out to private contractors who generate the lion's portion of revenues from advertising. And this affects, this will affect the streetcar system if this policy continues this way, and it will, and it could improve the bus system if we made that initial outlay in capital expense to integrate digital signage into our stops. And I'm advocating for that, and our, I think the majority of the committee also thinks that this is something that we don't have funds for, but it's something that we should get a price tag on and consider try to offset that long-term direct O&M cost. Hey, Jeff, just one quick question. You, you mentioned greater economic return vis-a-vis -vis sales tax revenue. Can you, for me being a new person to this process, can you give me some of the cities that have, have had greater economic return vis-a-vis uh, -vis sales tax uh, where it's been successful? You can look at nearly any city that has installed a streetcar system. The public transit arguments aside, you can look at nearly nearly any city that's put in a modern streetcar system. And the ratio of return has been $4 to $12, depending on whether the urban land use principles marry with the streetcar system that's being put in. So if we uh, react to this, I think some of it's going to happen organically. Some of that return will happen organically. You know what? I can tell you right now. Lift apartments w would be in debate if a streetcar system wasn't going in. Lift apartments it has already uh, decided that they were going to build a $42 million apartment project in Midtown and uh, provide a diverse housing of all different uh, cost levels to different residents. They located there because of that. The uh, Contemporary Arts Center up at 11th and Broadway that's about to be, begin construction. Their concern was they were too far away from the core of downtown. And it was when the streetcar system was moved there, the Kirkpatrick Foundation decided to move on building that facility. Um, the Edge Apartments, the Edge Apartments of 13th and Walker was also helped stimulated by a streetcar system. The developers are taking notice. They're not terribly vocal about it, but I have had affirmations from developers who have projects in the works right now um, that our route decision, the route that's already been approved, um, has affected their willingness to invest in downtown. And so the city is already seeing a return on something that doesn't even exist yet. 
and I think it will continue to do so. And if you look at any peer city in the United States, I think that example is well established. Thank you. There's a, a large body that believes that this, as the, per, the primary purpose of a streetcar is real estate development rather than as a transit tool. I mean, the economic return, I don't think is debatable. It, it's, it's substantial. In fact, it's more for real estate development than I think actually as moving people around. But that primarily results in increases in property tax. And the city of Oklahoma City, except for being able to bond, doesn't able to capture that. So maybe long term it results in a net increase in sales tax, but we're two years away. And you're not going to get the development, especially in this economic climate, to come up with an extra $3 million in sales tax two years from now. I, th I think that's my concern. We we're in a unique environment where we can't access property tax for uh, the city's general fund. And that's the primary economic return that you, that you see is in property tax. Yeah. So, all right. You are. Yeah, David, go ahead. I'm getting off the subject, but I think it directly relates to the discussion we've had so far. <clears throat> not so much on whether or not we should choose an alternative route, but every member of the council's interest in, in funding for these types of projects, not only the initial cost, but the ongoing uh, maintenance of these activities. I think it just heightens the importance, and all of them have been uh, talk, all of our discussions have been talking about future increases in revenue. Now, the differences all pertain to, well, how much increases. My point, I'm sorry I'm taking so long to make it, is Oklahoma City is truly the only economic growth generator in the state of Oklahoma. I think it's critical right now, given the state's budget problems, for us to try to create a meeting with, I know we're limited to not more than four people of the council, I'll set away, I mean, I won't attend, but for members of this council, our finance uh, department and the governor, the speaker, the Senate pro tem, and their finance people to come together and have a true discussion about trying to revisit the entire tax structure of the state of Oklahoma and work together, the city of Oklahoma City and the state of Oklahoma. They just continue to ignore the importance of the city of Oklahoma City. I also think this economic downturn that we're experiencing um, is not going to last as long as some people believe. I'm not pro providing any uh, specific uh, suggestions as to when that will improve, but I just don't think it'll, uh, it'll last as long as what some are. The numbers just won't allow it to uh, be that low uh, for that length of time. Once it recovers, the state will go on its normal business and continue to ignore us. I think they hopefully recognize the importance of the city of Oklahoma City and we need to begin to work together. So I'm just asking that we try to reach out to them. And maybe it has to wait until after May when they get through this session. But we really need a sincere discussion with the state of Oklahoma on how we can work together to improve the overall tax structure of, of that benefits them as well as us and helps us to continue to be the main economic driver for the state of Oklahoma. Thank you. Well, and probably a good time to point out that when the state allocates its public transit dollars, a rural citizen gets more of their tax dollars for their rural public transit needs than a urban citizen does. And so just so people, because that, that's counterintuitive. You would, you would assume Oklahoma City and Tulsa get the most public transit dollars per person, but it works in reverse. In your honor, there are several other examples that just don't make sense. That's why I'm just saying, let's get together. And if they can convince, them, convince us, that being the state, that they do make sense, we're just not seeing the complete picture, that's okay. I'll be surprised if they can do that. <laughs> and then it's a matter of, well, how do we modify that? Right. Thank you. All right, well, we probably need to get moving on this. Any other comments or questions about the, the the cons, the pros or cons of Route 3 and, and uh, moving forward today on a boat? Okay. 
All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, cast your votes. And it passes 7 2. I want to thank the staff and consultants, and Jeff, please pass along our appreciation to the Citizen Advisory Board and the Citizen Oversight Committee on this project. I know you guys really work hard. Thank you. All right, item uh, 9B is an opportunity to enter into executive session. Do we need to go into executive session on this we do. All right, is there a motion to move 9B into executive session? Second. All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 10 is items from council. James, you have anything? Ed? Larry? Pete? David? Meg? Just briefly, we yeah, had an overwhelming you. response to the Senior Wellness Center. I talked to Bill Fleming. We're getting a lot of calls. A lot of people are excited about it. And uh, if anybody has questions, please call the city. Uh, or you can call Bill Fleming. He said he didn't mind if I gave his phone number, 370-0996. We're trying to uh, start working on our membership program for the Wellness Center, and we're really excited about it. Good. And uh, that brings us to city manager reports. We have a couple this morning. Our first is our uh, presentation on the council priority to provide a safe and secure community. And uh, with that, we're going to have presentations by the police department, the fire department, and EMSA. And first up is Chief City with the police department. Thank you, City Manager, Mayor, Council. Uh, we're going to talk uh, briefly about uh, your, your, your priorities in providing a safe and secure secure community and, and how that plays into what the police department is doing and the measurements that we are using through our LFR. Uh, we're going to give, I give you some statistics first so that you can kind of get a, a, a review of what's actually going on crime-wise. Uh, this, is, this is going to be since 2002, about 14 years of data so you can kind of see what a pattern is with our homicides uh, last year. Uh, now you keep in mind the, these are UCR, which is the, the uniform crime reports that the FBI, they exclude certain things like officer-involved shootings, uh, self-defense, those types of things are not in these numbers. So when we say our homicides in public, like last year were 63, it, it did not exclude those because we still count those for our own purpose. But for the uniform crime report, uh, you saw where last year we had, oh, we had 45. Uh, this year we actually uh, had 74. The yellow line originally indicated that it was, a, it was a, an estimate, but it was actually 74 uh, for 2015. If we were going to count it, we actually had 89 because we had this year our, our self-defense numbers were through the roof. We had nine versus one the year before. So those numbers had an impact on that and some officer-involved shootings. So that's where we're at uh, in homicides. Uh, rapes, this one is the one since 2011 has been going up significantly over a 14-year period. It's, it's as high as it's ever been over that 14-year period. Uh, some of it we can contribute between 2012 and 13. Uh, the, the, uh, the feds changed the definition of uh, rape, it included more people within that rape, uh, particularly males. Uh, so that's going to contribute some to it. Uh, a lot of it, a lot of it is. Think, I don't think that there's probably that many more rapes, other than the fact that there's more awareness about rapes. We're having more discussions about rapes and encouraging people to, to report it and trying to support the victims. So I think there's just a lot more awareness and, and, and more willingness to report those. And I think that's why you're seeing a lot of that since 2011. Uh, robberies. We were up from last year. Uh, you can see over that 12-year period, there's, there's probably seven years. Half of that is going to be below that uh, 2015 number, and half of it's going to be equal or above. Uh, it's, it fluctuates. I can't tell you why in 2008 it was as high as it was. Uh, you can see when we had our economic crisis, you can see where it, it was one of the lowest. So uh, to try to figure out why uh, those robberies fluctuate, uh, you know, I've never heard any good good reasons for that. Uh, but it, you can see we did go up from last year. Our aggravated assaults, our estimated number, because we don't have December uh, yet in our UCR numbers, so we've updated it through November. All these numbers are through November. 
and then we've estimated out the rest of that, that one month. But you can see where our aggravated assaults since 2012 have been on a, a positive trend for us. I mean, that's one area that we've worked on continuously after 2000, after it really peaked in 2012. And you remember we also had a, a, high, a high number of homicides, like 99. Uh, some of the initiatives, the added officers, the overtime that you allowed us to use uh, to put additional officers on the street in those high crime areas contributed significantly to that drop and, and continues to. So that, that's about only about a 1.2 percent drop. We'd like to have it a bit, little bit larger, but it is still on the positive trend for us. Chief, can I ask you about what, what, what do you expect the overtime to impact which, which one of these categories? Well, the ones, you can have, the, the ones you can have the most impact as you add officers is going to be actually going to be assaults. Uh, what we don't, we're not showing you here, one of the biggest impacts in doing the initiatives on our, on our aggravated assaults is that our property crimes have just, real, it, it, I didn't realize what it would do to it, but being in those high violent crime areas has just really dropped, it's dropped our, our burglaries uh, astronomically. I mean, you know, it's just a huge percentage. And, uh, our larcenies, all of our property crimes have just really, our overall reduction in crime, uh, like this year, you only see 1.2 percent in assaults, reduction in assaults, but our overall, our, our crime this year is probably about a, a minus 4 percent or 5 percent because our property crimes are so low. We can, we, so we can impact those things by putting more officers in the field. The things we struggle to impact would be, would be rapes, uh, homicides. I don't look at homicides as a trend, and when I, you know, when I do interviews, I try to try to impress upon them. Homicide is is an assault with the worst possible outcome. It's a, it's an assault. So the the trend we really want to look at is the assaults over a period of time to tell us whether or not we're actually making a difference. Because, I mean, I, the homicides will fluctuate. I mean, for what it it depends on whether a person lives or dies. It's still an assault, and it depends on medical care how quickly they got medical care, where they were shot, those types of things as to whether or not they survived. So uh, there's, there's too many other uh, independent uh, variables to that to be able to really say that homicides can give you a significant pattern. Now, if it goes up, up, up constantly, and assaults do too, then it would be, it'd be a huge concern. Did that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Uh, one of our measurements is, is actually is reported, and I've, I've talked a lot about it already, really reported aggravated assaults in the calendar year 15 or aggravated assaults is estimated there will be the 3139 that you saw on the uh, flow chart on the, uh, in, in 16 our target is a 5% reduction. Every year since 2012 we've tried to do a 5% reduction. In the beginning it was much larger. We easily made that as you can see last year. Uh, in 15, it was 1.2 percent, but uh, that is our that's our goal for for next year for 16. Uh, you can see where the trend from 2012 to 2015, our aggravated assaults have decreased by 17 percent, which is a, is a, is a good good decrease for us. And you can see here uh, our clearance rates on our violent crimes. Uh, the numbers that you'll see is a national average. That's, that's all agencies that have to report those crimes to, uh, to the FBI on the, UF, the UCR reports. So you can see with, uh, with Oklahoma City, homicides in 14, we were, our clearance rate was 69. National average was about 64, 65. And uh, you can, the only area there in, in, in 2015 on the current ones, we were up above those in all areas except robbery where we were right at 29%, which is pretty much the national average. But keep in mind, we like to compare ourselves, too, to, to cities that are com com uh, comparable to us. It's, it, it, makes, it makes more sense. It is a better comparison if you compare us with a city over 500,000 to a million. And if you look at that, for instance, instead of that national average of 64.5, the average with comparable cities is 56. So. We're better than national average, but we're way better than cities that we compare ourselves to. Uh, in the av aggravated assaults, uh, the percentage for cities uh, basically our size are 43 percent, not 56 percent. Uh, for rape, it's 37 percent, and for robbery, it's 23 percent. So 
uh, that's, a, that's a better gauge of, uh, if you want to compare us to other cities as to how well we're doing. Chief, uh, excuse me, the difference between robberies and burglaries, could you explain that? Well, uh, an armed robbery is somebody taking something from you by force. Personally, one on, I mean, one-on-one, -on -one, they take it by force. It doesn't have to even have a weapon. All I can do is threaten you, give me your money, or I'll, you know, I'll, you know, I'll assault you. Uh, and that's, that, that's by a threat of force or force. A burglary is merely the breaking, breaking in, uh, taking your property, but not confronting you. Now, if, if you are confronted, if you go into a house, we call, they call them home invasions and have for years, which is a burglary, uh, that somebody may confront them, and then if they stay and then they steal from you, at that point you could have a robbery, burglary, uh, and, and it's a burglary one if you're at home, so it's a higher, higher ranking burglary. So the difference is just kind of simply one on one by force is a robbery versus a burglary, which is breaking in and, and taking your property, whether it's a car or a house. The other measurement that we have is the percent of citizens who report they feel safe citywide. Uh, the surveys go out every year now. So in 2014, our survey was at 51 percent. Uh, in 15, uh, we gained a couple percentage points to 53 percent. And our target still remains at 55 percent. That target was set back in 2005 when we first started our leading for results process. And that was actually what the survey showed. Uh, back in, in 2005, so we've kind of used that as a benchmark ever since. Uh, obviously, we'd like to be higher than that benchmark, and that's the goal, but uh, that kind of gives us a, a place of where we're at. Uh, you know, we're, we haven't gained a whole lot of ground on it, but we haven't lost a whole lot of ground either as, as far as that's concerned. Chief, do we, ha do we have any statistics that would tell us how safe people felt, say, 25 years ago or 30 years ago? I, I, I've always, well, I'm, I'll, I'll let you answer before I tell you what. No, I, no. The answer is going to be no. I mean, I, this, if you look at if you look at statistics 25, 30, 40 years ago, I would not rely on those statistics if they have them. I, you know, I always I always take issue even with people that say we we were, we're much safer now than we were back 40, 50 years ago. Well, I don't know what data they're using, but I can promise you that we didn't. This department didn't keep really great accurate data back in those days and other departments didn't either. We're so much better with the technology where we keep and track it. Uh, it'd be very difficult to compare. The only thing you can really compare probably honestly is homicides. Uh, but it, it would be very difficult on a lot of those other crimes. Actually I'm talking about because this is a this is a we're, we're measuring a perception here as opposed to right. measuring actual facts. Right. So I, I've always wondered if it's not affected by uh, the difference in the way the media reports crime now. Uh, you know, I can remember watching TV and I didn't ever see that lady that shows up every time there's a tornado in that tank top with a bleach there. I mean, she wasn't on TV 25, 30 years ago. Right. And, and she's there now at every crime and everything else. And I just wonder if that doesn't have some impact on, uh, on people's perception of safety. I think, I think anecdotally, yeah, I mean, I, I think there's no doubt yeah. that they, they believe what they see. The media has a, a huge influence on, on how we feel. And, and the more crime that's put, you know, showed on there, people feel they're going to feel less safe. I, I think there's no doubt about that. So, and the, and, the, and the thing is now there's so many other ways to see it, the social media included. There's so much other ways to see violence within the community. And, because that's kind of what sells, and that's what a lot of people watch. It's been something that's come up in my area um, because people complain about lack of being able to see a black and white or a black now, I guess. Um, but And then I show them the crime statistics for the neighborhoods that they live in, and they think, oh, that can't be so. You right. know, you know and, I, and I think it's just, it's... If we had a way to manage perception better, we'd be we'd be better off. I'm, I'm not sure there is a way to do that, but uh. right. well, I, I mean, the, I had a someone in a neighborhood meeting one time came up to me. It was uh, this was by ten miles from the Irwin Corps, and, and uh, the guy said, you know, I'm, he goes, I'm not complaining. I'm just asking. He says, he goes, I just don't see 
a police car driving in my neighborhood, but then when something does happen, on that rare occasion something does happen, there's 15 police cars. He goes, where are they the rest of the time? <laughs> so, you know, and so my response was, I um, got police chief city to come out to their next meeting. Right. <laughs> to kind of explain that. that. That was my response. But I, but I think he brings up a good point, you know, that, that uh, you know, you, you don't necessarily, you know, see them, you know, the, the beat cop, those days are over, and in every neighborhood you, you think that there's no police officers around here. Well, if there's an issue, it's amazing how fast, you know, right. I think in, 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 in relationship to how big the city is, how fast we respond and, and how thorough, which was, I think, his point, right. how thorough we respond. So. Yeah. We, uh, we, I think we the other thing that I've seen, um, just from my experience in Ward 8, and previously it was Sergeant Epperly today, it's Sergeant Scala. The police department does a great job of getting out to the homeowners associations and communicating the things that need to be done to be better protected. Not that we always act on, on it, not that we always follow it, but, um, and I think it's important that we periodically remind our homeowners associations and our neighbors the things they can do. I know one time when we were having a break-in problem, um, the lady next door saw the, 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 the people breaking in and did not call 911. And she was asked why, and she said, well, I, I, I didn't want to bother the service. And so we need to remind our citizens that they need to help the police too, I think. Right. Yeah. No, good. That's a very good point. And I do. I, the, the, the different divisions, they do get out a lot with the neighborhoods and are pretty proactive about working. So I appreciate your comments. Chief Councilman Stonecipher just reminded me that there's a wonderful program that you have trained some of your officers in uh, that goes directly to even architectural design mm -hmm. and how we can make improvements, whether it's parking garages or um, it would be wonderful to maybe for us to hear that someday or right. for um, that to be a little bit more widely um, disseminated. Right, and, and this year that's the SEPTED. That's, that's, yeah, it's... it's you know, environmental design, architecture, like you're talking about, lighting, those types of things. And we've trained more officers this year, and we've actually worked with the Neighborhood Alliance, uh, and they've trained some people uh, together uh, to really work with the neighborhood. Yeah, and we've and got these huge projects coming on. We've got a convention center, you know, coming on. And so just to, you know, even visit briefly about some of those options, um, right. we might be able to include some of those safety factors into design. Be glad to. Okay. Chief, sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. Thank you. I'm all, you can interrupt any time. It's positive. I'm fine with that. So <laughs> appreciate it, Mayor. Uh, percent of citizens who report they feel safe. This is kind of a historical viewpoint of that. You can, you can see what the actual is. Our target's been the same every year. Uh, our, our highest year was in 2009. Uh, our lowest year was in 14 and 12. Uh, again, you know, I, I, I can't explain why it went from 53 percent in 12. I could, I could tell you crime was so high, homicides were high, our numbers skyrocketed that year, if you can remember, uh, that, you know, that's, that's the reason for something like 53 percent, but then I can't tell you why 13, although we did, we did make a huge, as you can see, if you look at, at the chart, we, we lowered the crime during that year, and maybe there just wasn't as much of it on, on television, so um, within 14 it goes up, and we were still lowering the assaults in, in 14, so. And some of it may just happen to be where they actually, where the, step, where the survey was taken in the households and in certain areas of the city may impact that. Provide a safe and secure community, police response time to life-threatening calls. Uh, we, you know, in the staffing study, a uh, part, large part of that staffing study was how quickly we respond to uh, our most serious crimes. We call them priority one calls. Those are life-threatening calls. Uh, that's our priority. Those are ones we don't we want to respond to as quickly as possible. And we measure that from the time the dispatcher gets the call to the time the officer arrives at the location. That's, that's our measurement. So, and, then our, and our goal in that is to, is to respond to those 80% of the time in 9 minutes and 30 seconds. That's our goal. As you can see here, our actual uh, 15 response time was 71.7%. And really, over the last several years, that's, that's been about... That's been about average. We have not, we have not, you know, we have not increased that percentage uh, over the last several years. I think our highest percentage a couple of years ago was 73 percent. As you can see, 2010, 73, um, in 11, 75. So I was wrong. It was 75 percent. Then you see 70, 72, 71. So uh, for years we did for the staffing study, we had it at 90 percent 
Um, we had a lot of discussion about what that percentage should be because there's no national standard. There's nothing to base it on. Cities are different. We have a lot more area to cover, as, as the mayor had mentioned. Uh, so, you know, we, we didn't know where to set it. We, so we really, we, we feel like 80 is probably more reasonable target for us to make than, than, than 90%. So that's where we're, we're setting our target for, uh, for future years. And then here, any questions? I guess, yeah, that was the last slide. Any questions? I'm sorry. I was, <laughs> well, I was behind. Yeah, one. Ed. So I, I, don't, I don't necessarily share David's optimism about the future. I'm moving into the Pat Ryan level of <laughs> pessimism. But let, let's say that there is a severe downturn um, that extends for a couple of years, and we have to make tough choices. What would you, what have we learned from previous downturns, um, wh where would you expect any kind of spike? And then I guess the con converse of we we've seen benefit from over time and, and targeting certain areas, like it, with the federal grant was a four square mile area. I'm not sure if we've seen benefits there, but um, does the opposite happen? I mean, if we have to cut back on overtime, would we expect property time to increase or property crime to increase, assaults to increase? You know, I, I think if I'm going to tell you that because of the overtime programs, we've been able to lower crime, then the opposite would occur. Yeah. We aren't able to do that. You know, the idea, the I, I mean, theoretically, as you add those more officers that you, you have over the last several years, that we would put more officers on the street. And in, in, in getting so far behind in our, in our you know, hiring of police officers, which actually happened during the last downturn, uh, getting so far behind that we had, we've really had a, and we've had some retirements, it's been a little bit of a struggle to get those new positions in place. We're chipping away at it, but I would tell you that if we're not able, if we're not able to saturate some of those areas, either with overtime or additional officers, that, that you would either see, you would either see the status quo and most likely see probably crime go up a little bit. I mean, the reality of it is, is it really, it takes, it takes officers in the field to address those issues, be proactive in, in, in keeping crime in check or reducing crime. It just, you know, I've never, I, I've never seen anything that works better. You know, there's programs and those types of things. There's some cities that can do community policing a lot better than we can. We do a lot of it in the downtown area because of the smaller area, the denser population now, that's growing. Uh, we're able to do a lot more of, of the community policing type, but with this, with 600 and something square miles, you know, it's a lot of area to cover, and it's 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 really it's difficult. So, to answer your question, I I probably would would anticipate it going up some if we were not uh, continuing to to put our efforts into those areas. Thank you. I, I'll just say for kind of historical perspective because you, you, you rightly go back 15 years in our city's timeline and, and, and draw these charts. But if you think back to the city we had in 2002, it, it had 25% fewer people than we have today. And, and that's, you know, we're talking, what, 150,000 people additional. And yet we're talking about raw numbers. The second thing I would point out, if you go back to that city of 2001, 2002, there weren't a lot of visitors in Oklahoma City in those days. This is the sports arena had not opened up. Certainly, the NBA had not arrived. Um, the number of hotels in Oklahoma City was a fraction of what it was, and the number of visitors your city attracts affects your crime rates on probably on both ends. Um, you're probably bringing people that commit crimes and people that are going to be victims of crimes. And so, uh, I, I just ask you keep that in mind when you're talking about historical perspectives of this city and how right. fast it's changed. Uh, you know, the fact that they're even, you know, they're, the, the trajectory is what it is, I think, is, is pretty remarkable. Uh, right. And um, I, I, I spend probably too much of my time looking at crime data. For some reason, it, it interests me, and I, I love looking at the statistics and how it, but you, you always ask yourself, you know, this is also, this is reported crime. I mean, not everybody that, you know, has their car broken into is probably going to call the cops. Right. And so you're trying, which crimes are probably reported accurately, which ones are not. And you know, and how can we do better about getting people to report, you know, in their neighborhood? Because all that does is draw attention and and probably create a higher police presence. So, you know, there's there's no one answer, but uh, but 
you know, I, I, I just think that, you know, our police chief and his department have done tremendous work in these areas. And um, um, whenever there's some new issue out there, then I'm thinking, God, what's the answer to this? Or how are we going to respond to this? It always seems like Chief City is out there with a, with a better response than I would have imagined as possible because he's been working on this before I was. He, he was looking around corners and knew this was going to be an issue and has already been at a program in place. So I, I'm very proud of, of the work that you and your staff have done. I think you've hired well. And I think I'm proud of this council for continuing to add to the size of the police force. I think that's important. And probably what gets overlooked a little bit is the citizens of Oklahoma City and their willingness to invent and the capital expense, the, the communications and the technology, all of that is so important in, in, uh, in being able to, to get the most out of our officers, but also in the, in the crime solving aspect of it. And I know there's going to be improvements to come and uh, we're going to be asked to fund those too. But um, I, I'm just, I'm very pleased with where we are and there's a lot of things to take into consideration. And there's probably nothing easier to take out of context than a crime statistic. Um, and so keep that in mind when you're out there. There's probably 10 questions to ask about any uh, 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 opinion or um, any you know, subjective claim. There's, there's a lot of things to consider. Yeah, Meg? Yeah, if I could just make a quick comment, too. I think, Chief, what I've seen in my time on the council is how proactive your staff has been in tackling programs, bringing innovative new ideas. You know, we talked most recently about the homeless outreach team, but it has had a dramatic increase in the levels of folks that we have living on the street and how we're able to deal with them. And I know that it goes way deeper than that into your department, but I just, I feel as if, um, you know, we really are on a leading edge of very um, smart policing and really good programming, domestic violence. We know how closely you work with Jan um, at the YWCA, and you know I could just in the public schools, the truancy programs. We could just go through the list, but those things have to contribute in addition to the number of law officers on the street, which is critically important. But each one of those sort of more innovative approaches to dealing with crime on the front end, I think, is making a huge difference. And um, right. for that, please be complimented in all your staff. Thank you. Mayor, I could not agree more with your comments about what's going on with, with the public safety part of what we're doing, especially in the police area. It, it, when we were talking, though, about um, uh, uh, having not enough police officers, and that I thought back to what my earlier comment about people's perception. I think that's the key to that. I, I think perception would, would change if with a, with a physical, visual police presence. I think that's... I don't think it's based on fact because, as I said earlier, I mean, when I look at the crime statistics, the people that I get it from generally are people that live in extremely low crime areas, but they just perceive that it's not because, and they perceive it because they don't see police officers as often as they'd like to. So right. we've got to keep moving forward with, with getting ourselves back to where we were in terms of percentage of officers to the population and I think we're doing what we can to do that but I think we don't we don't ever want to lose sight of that yes, sir. Yeah. thank you all right any other comments or questions for Chief City all right thank, thank you. you next we have Chief Bryant I don't know. No. morning mayor council Mr. city manager Continuing on with the city's goal of providing a safe and secure community in terms of the services that the fire department uh, provides, uh, most of our key measures are in terms of response time, and that's all what I will be reporting this morning to you. Um, our key measures that we look at are fire incidents dispatched within one minute 90% of the time, and that uh, EMSA or at least department incidents dispatched within two minutes 90 percent of the time. I want to stop right there real quick and make sure I explain that. When a call comes in to 911, the 911 operator asks what's the emergency? If the person on the phone says I have a fire then that caller is immediately transferred to fire dispatch. So all call, our, our, nine, our fire department dispatchers take the caller, take the information down enter the information into our computer-aided dispatch system and dispatch the call. If it's some other type of call, vehicle accident, um, uh, EMS call, that call is either transferred to EMSA where they do their processing or 
the 911 operator starts in, entering the information in CAD. And so there, that's why the difference in the one to two minutes. Uh, but again, regardless of the processing, we want that done 90% of the time. And then on the other side of that, the actual response when the units have the information and leave the station. For fire responses, we look at that they, from the station to the scene within five minutes, 70% of the time, or an EMS responses uh, the same measure, five minutes, 70% of the time. This graph gives you an idea of the phone pickup to dispatch. So that's the first component of that, regardless of whether that is our fire dispatchers or uh, MSO or PD processing that call, that's what this uh, chart reports. So you can see it's, it's generally trending upward toward that 90% goal that we want it to be. And um, that gives you the, the red line, obviously, is when those fires are our dispatchers processing the call within one minute, and the same uh, measure when MSO or PD is processing that call. This graph talks about the actual response time, again, within five minutes from when the, the units uh, the personnel at the station receive that information, leave the station or wherever they may be responding from to when they get to the scene. Our target is 70% of the time, and you can see we've been hovering for a long time, around the 60%. I'll report to you here in a minute uh, some improvement in that area, but I just wanted to give you that for uh, perspective right now. Now, uh, you can see there by the red line, those are fire-related calls, so a structure fire, vehicle fire, something of that nature, and then the blue uh, represents emergency medical. As far as our strategic results, again, that all fire responses are within seven minutes. Now that's adding everything together, the dispatch processing time and our actual travel time. Um, and we want to get, again, our, our target is 70% of the time. That measure, as I stated earlier, is from the phone pickup from the 911 operator to when our units arrive on scene. Um, the phone pickup is the actual time it was picked up for police initiated calls. So again, depending on the nature of the call and how that's processed, there's a little bit of a time difference there and that's that 12 to 18 seconds that we refer to in that last piece of information. As far as our actuals, I want to point out too, as, as you all remember, uh, most of you anyway, that uh, our computer-aided dispatch merged with EMSA's computer-aided dispatch system in July of 2012. So for uh, fiscal year 2014, um, 58.54, or the, again, all responses in seven minutes. And as you can see there in fiscal year 2015, we, we moved up a little bit to 59.9%. Uh, and currently, in the current fiscal year to date, we're at 64. So that's trending upward, and that's, that's what we want it to do. Um, you can see the total number of incidents, which I think, the, um, again, uh, that's trending upward to get to that 70% target. Again, I think there's a couple of things involved there that I'd like to, I'm not sure I'm going to get to at that point yet, but go ahead. These are our total number of incidents that we're responding to. And you can see there in fiscal year 2012, going back to that CAD to CAD interface, uh, the goal of that was to lessen total number of responses by the fire department and only respond to the higher priority emergency medical calls. So you can see the impact that that had. But also, and the concern would be that uh, now that we're here, we're, we're creeping back up to where we were at that point where we, we, we took that action. So overall call volume is, is tending to creep back up on us a little bit. Um, I think the reason why we're, we're, we're trending up and getting closer to that goal of 70% of our responses, a couple of things I, I'd like to point out that we've uh, done internally. On the dispatch side, not only, we don't look at dispatch now as a, basically a group of people or, or an average that out. We go to the individual dispatcher and see what their call processing times are. And if we see some areas that we need to do some training or some corrective measures there, we've been taking those and that's shown an improvement within our individual dispatch personnel. We do the same thing out there uh, at the fire stations. We look at each individual fire company response time 
from leaving the station, well, from when they get the information to when they're leaving the station. And so if there's some, again, corrective measures to be taken there, or some uh, training that can, done, can be done to improve that, we, we've taken those steps, and I think that's why you see that trending up, because we, we've done those things internally. With that, that's all I have to report to you this morning, unless you have any questions. Take this opportunity, Chief. What uh, what can our citizens do um, as far as learning CPR, things like that? What can they do to, to help you guys in, in your in your job? Well, that's one thing, and we have an active citizen CPR program that we offer to our citizens. So, again, as far as intervening in a medical emergency, you know, we did the demonstration some time ago uh, before you all. At that point, Dr. Goodlow, you know, talked about that that that. We, we have that good uh, uh, heart attack survival rate in this community, and I think part of that is because of the, the program this, that we put out there, because it needs the earliest, quickest intervention as possible, and that has to be at, at the citizen level. If people have neighborhood meetings, is something like that available? Absolutely, you bet. Okay. Uh, we do that. They can come to our facilities, and we also go out, again, to a neighborhood meeting or some other uh, church group or what have you, and uh, we do that very, very often. I just want to tell you, I told you that before the meeting started how much I appreciate the fact that you have uh, EMTs that in, in the rural areas now at a level that we didn't ever have before. I, is that citywide or am I just the only beneficiary of that? No, again, as the, we continue to hire paramedics and train more of our own people to the paramedic level, we can increase the number of advanced life support engines that we have out there in the city. So we're almost there. Almost all of our engines now are ALS capable. We have just a few more, and we should be adding some because we've just re uh, graduated a recruit academy that had paramedics, yeah, so we, we intend to continue on with that. It, it goes to, back to what I was talking about earlier about perception. I think the fact that they're there makes a difference. I don't know, I understand the statistical anomalies that occur b based on where you place them, but the fact is that in the rural areas uh, that Larry has a lot of, and John has a lot of it. James has a lot of it. It makes a difference if people know that. And when I go to neighborhood meetings and, and, and things like that in those areas, to be, able, to be able to say that, I think, raises people's level of, of that um, how safe do you feel thing. I, um, I'm sorry we can't, uh, this because of the budget situation, we, we're not going to be able to build that fire station southeast. Because I think that, too, will contribute to that. It, obviously, it will contribute to safety to some extent to have it there. But I suspect it will contribute as much to the confidence that people have that we're looking after them as it actually does in terms of what. We're looking at it just as a delay. We'll get you there. You bet. Yes, sir. I, but I want to thank you. You guys do a great job. Thank you. Like. Agree. The, the study that looks at the renovations of each fire station, where where are we with that study? The study's been completed. We have the report. Um, obviously, we're looking at that and, and doing what we can uh, right now with the uh, funding that we have for building maintenance to address some of what we consider the more higher priorities or important aspects of uh, repairs, uh, remodels that the report uh, suggested in terms of uh, rebuilding stations that, that uh, again, that we may have to look at that in the future in terms of uh, how we'd fund those things. But we have the report; it's been completed, uh, and it looked. We, we know what we need to address, and so that's just kind of the way we're looking at it right now in terms of the available funding that we have now and what we can use that funding for to address those issues. And then but that would be on some of the higher uh, price items as far as rebuilding stations and so forth that that come in the future. That'll be a tool for us to use as we Correct. look at the next yes, part of authorization. Right. Yes, sir. And it looked at each and every station. Yes, yes sir. Okay. Thanks. In reviewing uh, Mr. Crumb's article uh, this morning, uh, and, and I think you answered the question, a 40% survival rate for heart attack victims, uh, that's a good number? That's what you're saying? Yes, sir. And, uh, and can, we, uh, that's in kind of based on a national average. Yeah. Again, okay. we're, we're, and that, that was the question my back, that's one of the back in my mind. Is that a good number? Survival rates are seen in the country. Yes, sir. Sure. And then um, the other question, could you explain to me a little bit about the uh, level zero discussion that was in the paper today? Sure. I mean, uh, and Jim Wyndham, I think, is following me up here in a minute. He could probably do a little bit better job. But obviously, um, but there are only so many ambulances out there at any given time. And depending on the demand on the system, if all of those ambulances are being used to transport people, 
that's where that that means level zero. That, that there may not be an available or an ambulance immediately available. At that time, that triggers us to respond to all EMS incidents in, instead of just the high priority ones. So our call volume goes up a little bit. Um, last year, about this time when I made this report, I, it it was it was a lot more. It was a lot more frequent uh, since then. And again, Jim can speak to this. It's it's, it's gone down quite a bit. I, I can report that to you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Councilman. That was a nice segue into uh, Jim Wynnum uh, is here. He's, he's the Chief Operating Officer with EMSA. And uh, is up next. Good morning, Council, City Manager, Mayor. My name is Jim Wynnum. I am the uh, Chief Operating Officer for EMSA. Mr. Williamson couldn't be here today. He's, uh, had, he's out for surgery and convalescing, but I'm just glad to report he's doing much, much better. So. As you can see here on our slide, this shows from December, uh, excuse me, from July to December 2015, our response time compliance to priority one emergencies is 88%. Now that's 88% without exclusions. For contract compliance, it was 90% for each one of those months. I want to take a second and explain exclusions to you. That's when uh, the contractor, the provider for the EMS service, is given exclusions for things that are out of their control, like weather, ice on the road, uh, a declared disaster, or in some cases, when our matrix, the number of calls that we have per hour, is 200% greater than what is the historical number for that hour, then they're provided exclusions. Those are rare, but that does, that does happen on some days. Um, so they have been in compliance for the last year. Their contract compliance is 90% uh, for each one of the priorities. Uh, priority one life-threatening emergencies, uh, which is 10 minutes and 59 seconds. Now, if there is a case where it's the contractor's fault, in other words, they missed the phone call or they, they didn't get there on time because they didn't have enough uh, ambulance broke down, something along those lines, they are not provided exclusions for that. Uh, this is a different contract that started November 1st of 2013. The prior contract, uh, was a lot less and there was more exclusions, which uh, the board noticed, took action, and changed that with this new contract. Uh, I don't have any other slides, and I apologize. Just a couple other things I'd like to talk about. Um, the cardiac arrest survival rate for witnessed uh, cardiac arrest in a shockable rhythm. The numbers for 2015 are almost completed. Those take a while to actually get that information because you have to follow the patient through the hospital et cetera, and you have to go to each one of the facilities to get that. So it takes a little while to get that, hoping that the medical director's office will have that completed by March uh, of this year, I think, is the time frame. Plus, they had some personnel change, and they have a new person in there, and they're up to speed, so we're hoping in March. We also do a survey uh, for our paramedics uh, that, with our patients that are transported. Uh, last month uh, was 91.8% that they felt the paramedic did a good job in the overall, and they've consistently in the Western Division been over 90% since we started the survey uh, back in, uh, for about a year and a half now. Uh, staffing has been an issue uh, with our contractor. Uh, there is a nationwide paramedic shortage. Uh, even Pinellas County, Florida, for example, now having to pay $35,000 bonuses if you stay there for five years to get people to come and work. Austin, Travis County, in Texas, which is a great system down there, having trouble finding paramedics. But as of today in Oklahoma City, our head count is five above what it should be. So we're at 93 paramedics. Now eight of those are in the academy, eight of, uh, eight of them are riding, excuse me, and three of them are in the, command, uh, in the academy that started last week. So that will bump us above once they get uh, out of the academy for there. Um, we are a contract, our contract has a performance based. Uh, so they have to meet the response times and other issues. If they do not meet the response times, they are fined per minute. And if they're below 90%, depending on where it is, it's up to $100,000. So there are financial penalties for them to perform. If they are chronically late, if they don't fix the issue, there's a provision for us to actually get rid of that contractor and find a new one. So I bring that up to you. That let you know that this is a performance-based contract, not a level of effort. They must meet these response time requirements consistently. So, Have there been any fines levied during this July to December period? Yes, ma'am, there were fines. Because uh, even though they make the 90%, they may be late on calls that were in that 10% and they were, 
they're fined per minute uh, up to $250 for certain fines or for certain calls. And then I'm happy right. to entertain any other questions that you may have. It doesn't look like there are any questions. Thank you very much for your work. For your we time. really uh, please pass along our appreciation to your staff and everyone that works for IMSA in that part of the process. Thank you, sir. Sure. Well. All right. And lastly, Kenny Sudel is here today, and he's going to give us a little bit of an update on the uh, our annual debt report and also on the uh, general obligation refunding that we did a couple of weeks ago. Morning. Uh, just wanted to remind you that. Um, uh, last year we adopted a debt policy and one of the provisions of that policy was that there would be an annual consolidated debt report that would come to you each year. So that's what's on the uh, city manager report today. Much of this information, almost all of it, is, is in some form or fashion in our annual financial reports, but this just provides a nice consolidated report to kind of allow you to see the program overall, some of the metrics together, and some of the things that we felt were important to uh, to notify you of each year. Um, the numbers are as of June 30, 2015. And so the first section, just to go briefly through this report, um, is kind of on the outstanding total debt. So overall, when you look at the city's geo debt and all the trust, it's about $1.5 billion. It's roughly half of that's geo, roughly half of its revenue bonds from the various trusts. Um, it is important to note that uh, most of these do have a dedicated revenue source and you know that's one thing that I think does differentiate us from other cities in that you know for example our geo debt doesn't put direct pressure on our general fund budget because it has a dedicated source in property tax uh, likewise most of the other revenue bonds have some dedicated user fee or other source that that uh, relieves you know doesn't lead to pressure on the general fund um, our debt load is considered low to moderate for cities of our size. And just to kind of give you a comparison, you see the numbers there on our debt per capita on a geo basis and the overall. When we looked at some of our peer cities that are AAA cities that are above uh, 500,000 uh, residents, their geo debt per capita was around $1,500. Their total debt per capita was around $3,000. So we're underneath those levels right now. There's another section there that talks about agreements of support. You may have heard these called moral obligations in the past. And again, that's just something that we wanted to report to you. These are all the different credits that the city has backed. So uh, that includes uh, COTPAS parking bonds, the golf bonds, um, and some of the economic development trust bonds and notes. And one of the reasons we had a report in there was because this is a finite resource. There's a level that that could get to that could put pressure on the city's rating. And our debt policy actually sets a limit that that cannot exceed 10% uh, of the general fund budget. So we're well within that. The general fund budget last year uh, was $415 million, so 10% of that would be about $41 million. What the report shows is that if everything went wrong, all the credits were not able to pay their debt, the general fund potentially would have risk of having paid $26 million. So there's not been any draws on those agreements of support, but that is something we want to make you aware of each year. Um, also, there's a couple of other benchmarks. The next section, one of those is on the GEO program. One of, the, one of the benchmarks we look at is the total amount of debt that we have outstanding compared to the full market value of all the property in Oklahoma City. And the reason that's a metric that we look at is that's something that the rating agencies look at. It's something that you can compare to peer cities. And the rating agencies feel like as long as that's under 3%, that that's a very strong metric. And we're at about 1.6 to 1.7 consistently year in and year out. On revenue bonds, there's a list there of what's called the coverage ratio. This would be the benchmark that we would look at on revenue bonds. And just generally speaking, it's a little bit different with each trust, but it's basically you take the operating uh, revenues, less the operating expenses to kind of get the net operating profit and you divide that by your debt payment. So in other words, it kind of is a ratio of how many times could you have paid your debt payment. So for example, um, the zoo trust could have paid their debt payment 10 times after funding their operations. Now I do want to be careful and stress that that does not mean there's a ton of money necessarily laying around because oftentimes that extra money is used for pay-as-you-go capital 
projects or other things that maybe don't are not included in the uh, uh, coverage ratio. So it's not a perfect measure, but it is a general measure that the uh, rating agencies look at and that we watch to make sure, you know, it's just an indicator uh, if there's stress in, in, on a particular credit. Also, there's a section where we talk about all the different bond ratings of our credit. Um, there's, a, there's a small um, legend there that kind of shows you the difference between Moody's and Standard & Poor's, who are the two major credit rating agencies that we use. Uh, there's AAA, AA, A, and then one of them says triple B, one of them says B double A. But the reason we listed those is those are the ratings that are considered investment grade, which means they have a high probability of paying their debt. And our debt policy does state that we will not issue any debt that is below investment grade. So I'm happy to report, and you can see uh, underneath that legend, a list of all of our credits and the ratings that all, all of our uh, uh, credits are rated investment grade. And, you know, something else to feel good about the city and its AAA rating, uh, when we look at the top 50 cities in the United States that are um, the, the top 50 largest cities, only 10 of them are rated AAA by both rating agencies. So we are one of those 10. So it's something we can all take pride in. Uh, in addition, there's some information about what all, all the different bond issues that happen during the uh, fiscal year 15. There's also some information because these numbers are as of uh, June 30, 2015, there's information about upcoming bond issues that we know about. For example, uh, next week you'll see a couple of resolutions for our annual GEO bond and our GOLT sale that we're going to be doing. So when we know of something, that will be on the report in the future. Uh, and finally, uh, there's one section at the end that's called material events. And when we issue publicly traded debt, we fall under some of the rules of the Securities and Exchange Commission. And there are some various events that they have listed, and, and they're called material events because they're really material to investors. But we didn't really have a way to report this to you all if, if in the event one of these things happened. Uh, most of them are negative in, in, you know, they're things like defaults or draws on reserves. Some of them are routine things like ratings changes um, or if we have to call some bonds when we're re refinancing them. And so I'm happy to report that there were no negative material events. There were, there were just some routine things like I believe uh, uh, Aquit, you know, had an upgrade by Moody's to AAA and uh, there were some bond calls when we were doing some of the refinancing. So that's kind of a brief overview of what this, this report will show you each year and you should see this generally sometime around January after the, the, the financial reports are in. So this is the first one that's ever come before you and, uh, you know, I would just kind of end it with saying I feel like this is a very positive report. It's very manageable levels. And I would continue to encourage the city to look for ways to uh, fund things on a pay-as-you-go basis. But if we continue to, to manage this wisely, it's, it's a valuable tool that can help us serve our citizens. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, let me go back to the first page. When you were talking about the per capita debt, the way that's – you indicated what the average was in the, across the country. Um, the numbers I indicated were really AAA. So, for example, other AAA, and, and this would be, I'll just give you the cities. We're comparing to, like, Austin, Boston, Massachusetts, Charlotte, Columbus, Denver, Indianapolis, Portland, San Antonio, Seattle. Those cities that are AAA and they're above 500,000, uh, residents or citizens, those numbers were about 1,500 on the GEO side and about 1,500 per, per capita. capita and about ours three and about 3,000 when you look at everything. And ours are 1,100 and 1,200 or, or 2,300. 2,300 would include everything. Right. And the, and what's the number for the peer cities? 3,000. 3,000. Yeah. Okay, so we're under. Yes, yeah, so we, we would compare our 1,100 to the 1,500 on the GEO side. Right. Everything in, we would compare our 2,300 to 3,000. Right. Okay, now those are the AAA rated cities. Yes. So there are a lot of other cities out there with a lot of other, with well, they, they would, that that would be. Would, logic would tell me they're probably not as, they would have a higher per capita debt yeah, than we do. That's well, one of the well, reasons well, we have a good rating. Yeah. But against the cities we compare ourselves to, that that's the. 
that's where we are. Yeah, if we looked at all cities that are above 500,000, regardless of the rating, their overall debt per capita was about $3,800 per capita. Where ours is 2300 Right. Correct. Um, what, what, this is not uh, so much directed at you, but it's a kind of a comment on the entire situation. With our debt per capita being as low as it is with regard to uh, GO bonds, you know, maybe it's time that when we look, we talk about the, how few legs the financing stool for Oklahoma City stands on. Maybe it's time we looked at raising the mill levy. I mean, if we're not going to, we can't get financing any other way, and we're already that much lower than the, our peer city's average, maybe it's time to look at, we're at 18, is that right? 18 mills? Uh, 16 mills. 16. Maybe it's time we looked at, uh, as we go forward, to uh, uh, go to 18 mills. It's a, I don't know what difference it'd make uh, in terms of individual property taxes, but it seems to me if we're going to be left with one, the stool only having one leg, uh, maybe we'd be, maybe that's something we ought to seriously look at. We we touch on it every time we do a geo bond issue, but almost always it is we need to keep it at 16 as opposed to what's the real ramification to raising it to 18, and. Uh, it would give us a way to share uh, and valorum taxes a little bit more. And we just something to think about as we go forward putting this next bond issue together, I think. Uh, I, one, one other question that has to do with the, the Aquat um, bonds. Um, how many other cities uh, across the country that have uh, systems, enterprise uh, water systems like we do are rated this high. I mean, you can't get any higher than this, right? I mean, we're at the top. Yeah, that's of the highest rating. I I don't know that off the top of my head on water utilities, but I'd be happy to get that information. Right. For you. I, I just, you know, obviously something I'd like to know, but uh, it seems to me that's pretty unusual to have the water system rated that well too. Question I would have, you know, you were we were giving a figure on debt per citizen. And the Water Trust services a lot of people who aren't citizens of Oklahoma City. So how do you, how do, you do that, Matt? It would be difficult. That, again, that's probably why debt per capita is not necessarily a perfect measure. It's just a general measure that we look at. Yeah, I'm sure that that, that debt is allocated to our, our citizens. Yeah. Which, yeah. And, and you could and, you could argue. And is the airport part of this? Yes. Yes. And so the airport serves, you know, half the state. Or, you know, right. Mm -hmm. And, and there are some cities, you know, you, you mentioned Seattle, their report's not even in Seattle, I don't think. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I don't know how, that, how they're doing their math, but right. I think that, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of inconsistencies in trying to start comparing cities. It, it's not apples to apples, yeah. and, and there's not a perfect way to compare, but that's about as close as we have. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But, it's good but, information, but... Right. Yeah. My question is, though, is, it just goes to the ratings, not the per capita part. Look at that. Is how many other cities are rated that highly that have an independent water system? There's a few, but we'll get that. Okay. Okay. Okay, Larry. Um, this is a, a, a crash commercial comment that's a little bit foreign to thinking. Uh, you made an interesting comment that uh, it would be nice if we could get to a pay-as-you-go basis, and that happens to subscribe to my economic theory of no debt. And so there are ways to do this, and one of the geniuses that I had nothing to do with, one of the geniuses of our MAPS projects are that they're all built with zero debt. And that places us in a tremendous competitive advantage as far as providing things for our citizens. Thank you. And Larry, I, I agree with you typically, but there is a really fine edge line there. And I think my recollection is that the state's rating was actually lowered because they didn't have enough debt, which signaled that they're not taking care of their infrastructure, which is exactly true. And so. You know, we're kind of um, balanced very nicely to be super conservative, I think, from a fiscal standpoint, but we recognize that we have to take care of our house. And uh, I think that's real important to remember. It seems to me debt management is broader than that, and it is that uh, when interest rates are as low as they are right now, and, and depreciation rates or uh, maintenance chart rates are in excess of what the interest rate is. 
uh, it doesn't, it's not a bad thing to borrow the money to fix something uh, at this, at, with low interest rates. Now, if interest rates triple or double, that starts to change. But uh, uh, at the rates that we have, we're refinancing bonds because the rates are lower than, than they were even a few years ago when they were really pretty good a few years ago. So I think you have to keep a balance in that myself. Ed, do you want to say I just, to Pete's point about millage, do you know what the surrounding cities or state or city uh, elsewhere in the state, are they at 16 as well? Or? No, it, it varies greatly, and we can provide that information as well. But s some don't, don't have any geo debt, so there's a zero. There's some that are higher. I think Tulsa's is around 21, 22. 22 so, mills. Yeah, so it, it really varies greatly, and it just... Uh, what, about, what about Edmond or Norman or... Um, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I'd be happy to provide that for you. Uh, would you say that we're generally at the low end of the major cities in Oklahoma? I th we're below Tulsa, but my recollection is I believe we were above some of the um, surrounding suburbs. Okay. But, yeah. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Well, I just moved in as Councilman Whitehead had a nice segue into uh, refunding that we're, we're, we're doing. So, Kenny, can you talk to us about the last refunding? So, just this was just very quickly the next city manager report was just to come back and give you an update. Back in January, you all authorized us to do a refunding of the 2007 GO bonds, and you had authorized up to $38 million. At the time, we brought you a financing plan, and we thought we would save about $3.3 .3 million. I'm happy to report rates moved in our direction greatly, and uh, the result was we, were, we only had to issue about $32.5 million, so we refunded $38 million worth of bonds with $32.5 million. Um, uh, the interest cost on those was 1.43%, so it's just really, really low. That equates to it saves us over the next 11 years roughly about $500,000 a year in the debt service fund. And that represents, if you put it in today's dollars, about a $5 million savings for our citizens. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay. Sounds like you're good. Thank you very much. Right, thank you. Is that it? That's it? All right. We're on to citizens to be heard. I'll ask the citizens to keep their comments to council at three minutes or less. Let's see, uh, Joe, John, Wamastak? And we, we'll need your name and address for the record, please. Sure. Thanks. Thank uh, John Wamastic. It's 1508 Duffner Drive here in Oklahoma City. You know, I've been sitting here listening to the meeting, and I really appreciate you all. I know people like me, we only come here to either say nice things or bad things, but it's been really cool listening to you all this morning. I appreciate it. I'm here to speak briefly about the quarter short TIF. And I want to compare just briefly. Uh, a few years ago when MAPS, uh, there was a remodel needed for the arena to bring the basketball team here. It's $110 million or so. There's a big publicity campaign. TV ads, newspapers. I mean, we all knew about it. We were all asked to vote and support it. Now, the quarter short TIF, we're going to vote on it next week, is $400 million. $300 million is slated to be given to private developers. What's been done to publicize? I haven't seen any TV commercials, no ads. Have there been any town hall meetings with your constituents and the wards to ask them how they feel about giving $300 million in this TIF zone? I haven't heard about it. And I wonder why it is. This was announced to Oklahoma City Christmas week. I don't know about you, I was busy. And last week there was a, a nice presentation that talked about TIF and the impact in Oklahoma City economic development. All these years I thought MAPS was getting the credit for the development that's taken place and it's been impressive. I love what's going on with the city. But last week we heard TIF, the TIFs in the downtown area have, have done all this great stuff. 
maybe next time we have maps, we won't hear about TIFs and maps. Again, we'll get all the credit for the good things that have taken place here. I'm really just here to say I don't think that, uh, that it's perhaps in the best interest of Oklahoma City to give that much money to private developers to come in and do things that we've already spent hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars to develop these areas and prime the pump for economic development. I don't know that we need to do any more. Uh, the hotel is a close to $100 million. That's part of this court ashore TIF. That was not in the initial newspaper article before Christmas. There's been zero publicity about it. It's a controversial topic, I think you all know. I think this is worthy of public debate. I don't know about you, I'd feel uncomfortable going back to a ward and talking to regular voters about giving private developers tens and tens of millions of dollars to build things in areas where it's in their own personal interest to build there anyway. That's all I have to say. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, John. Can I, thank you so much for coming in. Can, can I, are you struck, I mean, beyond just what the city has done in terms of pu publicizing it, are you struck that a $400 million policy initiative, which is bigger than the original maps, has had no, no coverage in the newspaper over the last week since it was debated last week, or in any television media? I think there was one in the journal record, which is behind a firewall. But, it, but kind of a news blackout over the last week. Um, certainly, those at the Oklahoman would have the expertise and the resources to cover that. Are you struck that something on this magnitude, that there seems to be a news blackout? There, there's coverage about a first national TIF, but that's only one sixth of the picture since we're creating six TIFs. What, what are your thoughts on? I am stunned, frankly. This is something on a magnitude of a MAPS project. Uh, we've just been six weeks since it's announced. And I would describe it as a virtual news blackout. I don't know why. I'm not saying conspiracy. I'm not, not like that. But it, it really strikes me as a great curiosity that something of this economic importance to this city that you all are going to look at next week, there's been no information about it. I don't know why. But it deserves real public scrutiny. And it deserves an honest, open debate. Thank you. Thanks, John. All right, Joe Sarge Nelson. I'm Joe Sarge Nelson. I've been here quite a few times, in fact, a lot of times. I'm just going to give you all a fast glance. This was taken in the last couple of years, all the area where the uh, Convention Center and the streetcar supposedly going to go as of today. It's quite interesting. These were taken within the last few days. A lot of construction going on down there. And uh, these, in part of one of 30, came out of the county assessor's office. And that is one of the reasons I'm here. And after today, listening to uh, the gentleman talking about the rails, this and that, what I mean, it was quite interesting. But did you take note of the item, just like the gentleman just got through saying here? And of course, there hadn't been a whole lot of advertising about the rails, except when it's been in jeopardy, the changes. Uh, the taxpayers hadn't really been kept informed about much of anything. They're all in the dark. So I jumped out of the woodwork, got my feet wet. And I noticed between 1 and 12 items that was up on that screen, they kept going to the additional monies that's needed, unaccountable for. First it was 3 million, then 9, 12, 15, and it keeps escalating. Uh, I wasn't too far wrong when I said this thing's going to cost us $300 million. What about the people that's got to operate it and maintain it? That's a red herring. That's just dead money every month to operate that. I watched Mr. Bezdek over here, and uh, I've never seen him explain so much stuff and since, uh, since I saw the big scramble go on in here. But anyway, 
You up here in the horse, you already know that the council meetings that I've been coming to regularly for the past four years, doing so, and I'm going to read this so I don't get messed up again. I uh, was elected to be the taxpayer's watchdog some years back, and I'm looking out for the people and their dollars, and I am still going to do just that. They pay the tab. They got a right to know, and they are intended to be in the know where their hard-earned money is being spent. I went on and read the partial contract about the VPACs. I know mostly what's most all of it, but the clarity of the fact is the city is selling it between one spot to another, and it's called the uh, Oklahoma City Economic Development Trust. That's where the land has been brought. I do know of two parcels that are. And I was recently informed that some of you people are aware that some of the council members up here owned or are invested in that property. It started in 07 and 09. Now, my fact is, and I'm just going to just not even more worry about reading it. I'm, I'm tired of reading it over and over and over again. Uh, I'm going to ask, since I did ask Mr. McAtee about the envelopes I gave him, he said he turned it over to the legal counsel. Uh, I do hope the legal counsel does act on it because as far as the city people making money off the taxpayers deliberately is wrong. I don't care if you take a dime or a dollar, but you start taking thousands of dollars, that's a whole different ball game. And I do have, like I said, 30 of these, and they do have the names on them. All I'm going to ask is the council do their job. And I'm looking forward to a resignation or two within the next 30 days. If not, I will be in federal court to get the answers that I need answered. End of story. All right, Michael Washington. Yes, sir. Greetings, everyone. Uh, Michael Washington, Post Office Box 53153, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. I want to announce to the committee, first of all, that I am getting ready to run for City Council for Ward 7 because I feel like we've been the sham of what we need in representation. Now, with these gentlemen's great information that they've shared with me, I did not have an understanding. Michael, that we don't allow political candidates to speak to council on. I'm not a candidate yet. It's I not filed. I haven't filed my paperwork. I, I thought you just announced. No, 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 no. I haven't filed my paperwork yet. I said I have plans to. Not that I am. Michael, I'm sorry. I, I wish you hadn't have said that because I'd let, you know, you're typically very interesting to listen to. You think am I really? Yeah. Okay, I decided not to run until maybe next year. <laughs> Michael, it doesn't work that way. I'm sorry, you're, you're an announced candidate. I, I apologize for the policy that's in place, but you can understand the reasons behind it. We okay, just, well, can I talk about personal issues that I've been done wrong myself then? Not really. Not that you've announced yourself as a political candidate for a, for, for a Ward 7 council seat. We, we have executive session. We'll be back. Okay. Well, I'm gonna take